afternoon, everyone. We'll just give people a couple more minutes to come on and then we'll kick off. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Um, today is the 27th of January, 2021. Um, I just wanted to flag that we are recording the session and it will be available afterwards. Um, this is Fair Heat's um, sixth anniversary event. Uh, we would normally be doing this in, in, in person. Um, this is the second event we've got today. Um, last year we did these events um, at Rick's, um, but one of the advantages of moving to this format is it means we've got a slightly extended session today and we can get into um, other other areas. So today, the second session is a technical showcase. Um, we're running through to 245. The, the session is, um, I'll just come through. We're gonna give you a brief introduction and then we've got a session on external HCIUs. Um, we're then moving on to water treatment and close system water treatment. Um, we're then moving on after that domestic hot water. We had a number of questions from our prior session around domestic hot water and temperatures. Um, so we're just gonna go into some of the findings around that from the um, SIPSI uh, domestic hot water working group. Um, then looking at plate heat exchanges and substations and then we're moving on, uh, wrapping up session with acceptance testing. Um, the format is we're gonna have a 20 minute presentation on each session, and then we're gonna have uh, hopefully 10 minutes Q&A, um, which I'll, I'll be moderating uh, through it. So please, if you've got questions, post them on the Q&A chat. Uh, we'll try to get as, to as many of them as we can. Um, and as mentioned before, all of this will be recorded and then we'll be, um, and then will be published. Um, as an introduction, I think it's actually quite a good um, follow on, um, probably not intended from a couple of the main themes that came out of the session before and some of the questions we got from our session this morning, which is around, around how do we transition to low carbon heat. And there was things that came out around about uh, how we get down the experience curve, how do we make sure we share information and knowledge in the industry. That's what part of what today is about. Um, but there's also a big piece around um, bringing people into the sector, and that's quite a big part of today for us. Um, and it's off the back of our, uh, we have a research program which is set up around uh, graduate um, recruitment. I just want to very briefly touch on that before we get into other things, because a lot of the material we're getting in today actually comes directly from that. So Fair Heat Graduate Program, our... Um, Actually, one of the main reasons for Fair Heat and what we're trying to do is to try and helping bring people in the sector and inspire and develop engineers who will become future leaders in the industry. And here I've got four, four different cohorts that came in. Um, down bottom left, we've got Dan and Freddie, who were actually the first who came in. We then had a year stop, and then we've had, um, we had four, then three, and then four um, this year um, come in again of, of grads. Um, uh, all from chemical engineering backgrounds, who, so we're actually really focused on bringing people into the industry from, a, from another sector who wouldn't normally come in in this route. And the program we've got is a two-year program. Um, we generally bring people in. We have four six-month placements, so we've got two main sides of the business. So we've got the new build side, which is all about quality assurance from energy strategy specification right through to delivery. 
And then we've got the other half of the business operations, which looks after the monitoring process, but also then going into looking at um, networks that don't perform well and looking at how do we turn those around. Um, so there's these four rotations from design through um, delivery, then monitoring, and then uh, the sort of legacy systems. We do structured training, internal and uh, external, and we've got a lot of professional development that goes alongside that. So Prince2 project management, um, chartership, et cetera. Um, do a lot of internal CPDs. And a really big feature of what we're looking to do um, is we have graduate programs. Um, and we're using that to graduate projects. So everyone has two projects through their, um, through their graduate program where we're looking at independent research and really looking to get that to contribute back to business and wider experience. So um, people get experience leading those projects. Actually, really importantly, we get some really good information back to the network, uh, for the um, industry overall. Um, just some achievements this year. I've, I've put up Dan and uh, Freddie's photos there. They actually came in as part of the first graduate program we did. Um, it was actually James who came in the same year, um, who, but he had been in the industry for longer. But, Big for us, they both became um, chartered engineers this year, along with um, James and Lena, both became chartered engineers. Uh, we had four grad engineers who'd gone through and sort of graduated out to um, uh, consulting engineers. We've had four new graduates come in this year. Again, really, really pleased with the talent of people who are bringing in. Um, and we've also had some really good success where we're seeing graduate research projects have been carried out, actually being implemented in the industry. And that's what part of today is about. So I'm not going to spend any longer on this. What I want to leap straight to is external HIUs. Um, Tom Burton, um, which I'll go through, uh, external HIUs. Um, Tom Burton, who will be leading on this, I'm um, just going to flag up for him. He actually presented to the 40H conference in Denmark um, last year, uh, the findings from his research on the grad project. So I'll hand over now to... Tom Burton, uh, consulting engineer at Fairheat, and to uh, Claire Murray, who's head of sustainability at Evett Bernstein. Thank you, Gareth. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to kick today's session off um, by just uh, talking a bit about external HAUs and um, the the research project that um, I that ran for about kind of six eight months um, throughout 2019 and 2020. Um, so to, to start with, I'll just talk about the few of the kind of the main issues that we see with the current network configuration um, and then go into a bit about how external HOUs can kind of the, the solutions that these enable and how these can resolve these issues. Um, then before I um, go into a bit more detail about uh, my research project and the findings from that, um, Claire's just going to give us the, the architect's view on external HOUs. Um, the challenges that um, kind of you can face by implementing it and uh, what can be done to overcome these. Um, so before we start talking about the issues, this is um, so this is a schematic that should be kind of familiar to most people. This is what networks typically look like currently. So you've got the the one riser uh, running up the the kind of one riser per building per core. And then you've got these long laterals on every floor and HOUs are located internally to flats, kind of typically in utility cupboards. Um, that's what things currently look like. The the temperature temperatures, we've now managed to drop these down to kind of 55, 60 flow, 25, 30 return. That's has been spoken about um, in the, the first um, the first session and we'll, there, there'll be some more information about it in the third session as well. But what I want to focus about here is just is this side the the building side and the network routing options that you have um the first main issue the the title might have given this away a bit um is accessibility of hous and the kind of this really boils down to the fact that to maintain performance from handover throughout your network lifetime you need to be regularly servicing hous um and this, this can't just be most HUs, it really has to be 100% because a very small number of poorly performing HUs can really have quite a significant impact on network performance. Um, and whilst before this has just been a performance thing with um, new GLA uh, regulations coming through, the B-Scene 
specifically um, developers are going to have to start proving efficiencies in use and this is going to be over a number of years so this maintaining performance is not just going to be an operators um, issue now it's going to be really kind of developers as well are going to have to start thinking about this a lot more um, with the HOUs within dwellings you need cooperation from residents in order to gain access and this is a, a difficult and lengthy process and as a result that means it's quite expensive as well um, and this means that that 100% service level is really quite difficult to achieve in practice um, and what we also see sometimes is that uh, some residents are also responsible for maintaining their HOUs which means you've got third parties maintaining the system you don't know anything about um, how the system has been designed to operate they don't know kind of set points of the network the hot water space heating and sometimes also the the kind of the training levels aren't quite as good as what you would get from a, a qualified kind of HOU servicing engineer um, to give an example of the impact that um, accessibility can have on a system uh, this is a, a case study of um, project we worked on it's a 140 unit scheme and this graph is um, of the block level heat meter so you've got the flow temperature in dark blue the return temperature in green and the flow rate of the system in light blue and you can see so on the left hand side you've got a about a 70 degree flow temperature and the return temperature is sitting about you know, 60 65 degrees so really quite elevated um, and then you can see in the middle uh, about eight o'clock on the 20th of March this was a couple of years ago um, one bypass which we'd identified through uh, remote review of the data um, we found that this all of these performance issues were caused by this one bypass above an HAU um, that got closed and almost immediately the flow temperature dropped by about 25 to 30 degrees so it's really just quite a good illustration of just how much an impact each um, each HO you can have and kind of really reiterate the point that you need to be getting to 100% of these. Um, the other main issue um, that we see with um, the current uh, configuration is the overall length of the network. And quite so we're going to more specifically the, the terminal run. So this is the pipe up within dwellings. Um, and whilst kind of when you're in a flat, it doesn't look like a significant amount of pipe up across the entire development, pipe up in dwellings is about 50% of your overall network length. Um, and this is going to, this constrains your losses to a minimum, even if you optimize from a temperature perspective, from a, from an insulation perspective, really kind of the best you can hope for is about 90 ish watts per dwelling heat losses. Um, and CP1 2020, which is also uh, mentioned quite heavily throughout session, the first session, um, that's going to require networks to have uh, calculated heat losses of below 100 watts per dwelling. So th this current configuration really doesn't leave you that much flexibility in your design, um, and you really have to be go quite kind of heavy on the insulation and on performance to make sure that you can stay within that um, performance metric. And this is also going to be incorporated into the um, the heat network market frameworks. Um, well, is likely to be, which again was spoken about during the first session. Um, and this means that this could be, you know, this may end up being a regulatory requirement to design to meet this 100 watts per dwelling. And again, with the internal HEs, that is it's possible, but it's difficult. Um, so the... Sorry, can I keep the next slide on, please? Great, thanks. Um, so external HOUs um, are a very easy solution to both of these issues. And what we mean by external HOUs is moving the HOUs from the utility cupboards in the dwellings and putting them in um, in areas where they're accessible from uh, communal areas. So it's kind of the corridors in a flat, so you'd have an extra door um, with a corridor which you'd open, uh, which the HOUs would be in there. Um, the best way to, to optimize the design to minimize the extra floor space required, you could put two HAUs per floor per cupboard. You can also then set up a multiple riser set up with the risers actually running up through these HAU cupboards. So you're going from um, long terminal run pipe works to 
all you need is kind of at most half a meter pipe up from your multiple risers to each HAE. And the access is now possible without reliance on residents. So all you need is the, the riser key, which the, the operator will have. So access is instant to 100% of HAEs. And another benefit to this, which um, I haven't touched on yet, is that you're actually also removing all high pressure pipe work from your dwellings. And that really has um, opens up a whole lot of possibilities with regards to um, design from a hydraulic strategy as well. Um, and this would look, so this would look something, something a bit like this. Um, so whereas before we had one riser going up with a uh, horizontal pipework on each floor, you've now got uh, basically vertical pipework only. So these risers running up and about two HOUs, um, so two HOUs per, per floor, per riser, which means that um, it's not kind of one riser per flat, it's one riser per two flats where this is possible. Um, having an odd number of flats on a floor is going to make slightly complicated things, but definitely doesn't, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't uh, kind of swing the swing things out of favor of these. Um, so this is, um, just again, to go back to CP1 2020, um, the, it's now a minimum requirement to minimize your network length during design and the the optimal approach from a network length perspective is to have multiple risers with externally accessible HOUs. Um, that's the way to minimize your communal distribution pipework so you got, you've got rid of all your laterals and it also removes uh, is the best way to minimize your terminal run pipework. You can see that so this is a diagram taken from um, the new CP1 it shows the the impact of both the HOU location within the flats and also the impact of um, lateral pipe work compared to multiple rise pipe work. Um, so if this is um, kind of given all of the operational benefits and the um, also kind of network length benefits we've been discussing of HOUs, uh, externally accessible HOUs, sorry, go ahead, uh, next slide, please. Um, so why, why aren't we seeing this and why are we kind of, why are we struggling to implement this um, throughout the industry. And there are two kind of two real reasons, uh, two main reasons. The first one is that um, in the kind of the sales market and in the UK, the, the HAU area in the utilities covered counts as part of the sellable area of the flat. Um, and it's really not very clear how um, removing this area from dwellings is best incorporated to the overall financial um side of the the development the overall kind of the, the studies and the the analysis um typically the, the kind of discussions will say oh you're making dwelling smaller that's going to reduce the amount of money we can earn by selling the flats and that um historically has been where a lot of conversations have ended um the other main issue or the main challenge that we see is that um you really need the decision to be made and you need engagement from all parts of your project team at a very, very early stage of the project. This needs to be sorted out before the, the building layout has been confirmed because once um, once that gets confirmed, it's, it's difficult to add in extra risers and start reducing dwelling areas once they've been fixed to add this in. Um, so whilst a lot, of, um, a lot of conversations we've had have been very kind of positive and everyone's is well aware of the benefits of what this could have, um, a lot of the time, by the time that discussion's had, it's already too late. Um, so what my research project um, theme of that was to do was to um, investigate the life cycle benefits, so to put some put some numbers to the, the impact of accessibility and the impact of network length and compare this to the, um, the impact of reducing your dwelling area or by having this extra non-sellable or non-dwelling area within your development um, and that was done through a net present value assessment which um, I will come on to a bit later but before that I'll hand over to Claire to uh, discuss a bit from the architects for you how um, access, externally accessible HOUs are viewed. Yeah thank you so um, yeah so I suppose from an architect's view uh, it's possible to include externally accessed 
uh, HIUs. And, um, and really, uh, we, we try and encourage it on our projects at Levitt Bernstein because we know those the benefits that can be had. But um, as part of that, uh, I suppose some of the key things that we look for in terms of what's included, it, we need to understand, um, is it included in the client's brief or their ERs? Because that's a really helpful point for us to start from. And um, if we can see it in briefs and ERs, then um, we, we can, from that kind of really early stage, I'd be thinking about it. Um, and then leading on from that is discussing uh, the need to access externally from RBA stage two. So I think what we're finding is if it's left later than RBA stage two, then we're, um, oh, sorry, can we go back a slide? Just, uh, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, if it's if it's RBA stage two, then we can really integrate it in our design any later than that. And we need to reconfigure kind of flat layouts. Um, and it doesn't always work in the way we would hope it to. Um, but it doesn't need to be a fundamental change to the design. So you can see these two flats on the right show um, a HIU located in pretty much the same location. Uh, but one's externally accessible and one's internally accessible. So actually by switching the way a door operates on an external wall, you can actually turn it external without changing your building layout. So these are kind of flexible layouts that we encourage um, at Levitt Bernstein to try and make sure that happens. Um, but it does require thought and planning to make home layout work out. So you can't just, you can't just put it anywhere um, because it does mess up how your um, bathrooms and your kitchens and things are laid out. So we pop on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so here's two examples of dwelling. So um, what we usually find is the dwelling at the end of a corridor or a walkway uh, is the trickiest to kind of squeeze in because you'd normally have a door at the end of the corridor and instead um, you'd have to kind of turn a right angle to enter your front door so that you could have your HIU still accessible from the corridor because you end up with limited space on the corridor. So it does mean a little bit of a, a tricky one at the end of a, of a run. Um, but, you know, there's multiple options for doing that. Um, we acknowledge that it's kind of more economical to pair the HIUs between dwellings. Uh, but what we find is actually this makes the dwellings slightly harder to lay out. So, for example, if you took the um, plan on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, um, and you moved that HIU behind the bathroom, you'd end up with a very awkward bathroom shape or you'd need to take space out of the bathroom to put that HIU. So we're finding that mid plan tends to work best architecturally, but actually if we're talking engineering and, and the research that Tom's done, then you would try and pair them and put them in a riser. So that's kind of things that we're working on architecturally to make sure those layouts work out. Um, and then if we pop to the next slide, um, something that we've been finding is not only that um, the gross to net ratios between corridors and flats are kind of always questioned, but looking at um, different types of dwellings. So if we look at an accessible home, a wheelchair accessible home, you actually need much wider frontages, much larger bathrooms, much larger kitchens. And this can be um, slightly problematic for squeezing that HIU cupboard in because you end up with a, a limited frontage of your building. Although this, this is a, these are unusually shaped plans, um, they're actually slightly oversized because of that. But typically, um, if, the, if the plan was a, a square plan, we, we actually struggled quite a bit to get the HIU located on the external wall here, just because the frontage of the building, um, we needed set widths for our bathroom, our hallway and our kitchen, uh, and we couldn't squeeze those down anymore. But it, but it is possible, but it does require that kind of thought to get it in. We're also, um, a lot of our schemes are dual aspects, so we do need a thermal line on both sides of the building. So we need to insulate the wall and we're finding the easiest way to do this is to include the HIU inside the dwelling and, and keep the external wall line on the outside so that we're not um, costing more in building that cupboard. So the only cost difference is the door. It's not, um, and you've got a little bit of an internal wall. 
uh, but that would happen anyway in inside a dwelling. So in order to keep costs down, we kind of keep the thermal line on the outside. And then the only last thing to kind of um, consider with dwellings is that we're working to nationally describe space standards. So the government set space standards on dwellings uh, and their minimum sizes of dwellings. So it means that we, um, we're often pushed to work to the absolute minimums. So whilst uh, the most obvious thing would be to increase the size of the dwelling to fit that HIU cupboard in, we can't always do that. So we are looking at stealing space um, from the living room because that's the only space we're allowed to steal from. So bedrooms are set sizes, bathrooms are set sizes, kitchens are set sizes. So we can only steal out of that living space. But back over to um, Tom, that's all for me. Thank you, Claire. Um, so now uh, going on to the the research project that I ran. Um, so as I mentioned, it was a so it's a net present value um, study. So um, looking at the life cycle costs of externally accessible HIUs and comparing that to the conventional um, network layout that we saw at the start of this presentation. Um, so I did that over 30 years with a um, three and a half percent discount rate, assuming that any reduction in dwelling area would cause a reduction in revenue from sales. Um, and so the main main things we we're looking at were the network length from a capex, a heat loss, and a carbon cost perspective. Um, and also looking at the cupboard cost, so this the the extra insulation, the the doors, locks, um, also extra connections between longer connections between the HOUs and the the flats. Um, and then looking at the cost of access maintenance and the impact of the ease of maintenance on efficiency. Um, before we get into the um, so next slide please Gareth. Um, so before we get into the the results um, just a few um, key um, outcomes of the research that we found. Um, so from a network length perspective external HOUs allow you to reduce your network length by about 65 percent which is absolutely massive which and also has a has a large impact from a capex perspective, but also you can see from a heat loss perspective, you go from that to around about 90 watts per dwelling mark, um, which really on the boundary of that, the, the CP1 2020 boundary to down to kind of 40, 50 watts per dwelling, perhaps even lower than that, which means you're very, kind of very comfortably below that. And also um, this is gonna have quite a big impact on heat tariff and reducing that and making sure that your heat is affordable for your residents. Um, access is is instant with external HOUs, which means your ability to maintain performance is high, and the risk of resident tampering, although it's not a kind of a huge impact on the conventional layout, you also completely remove that risk as well. Uh, but then at the bottom, you see is that it's about 0.3 meters squared per dwelling of cupboard area that you need to find space for and you need to account for in your design. Um, So um, looking at the results, um, apart from the most expensive areas in London, so this is the zone one, zone two areas in London, um, external HOUs over 30 years are a net benefit to, um, from a cost perspective. So it's really only um, these most, um, the most central areas which are kind of, whilst there is some, um, with some residential buildings in there. A lot of that's kind of more of a commercial area, but in several of the areas of large development currently, both in London and uh, outside of it, this over 30 years is a benefit um, from a financial perspective. So you can see this within London. And then if you go outside of London, um, the benefits are basically everywhere outside of London, you are getting a net benefit over 30 years. So that's the, the reduction from a capex from your uh, reduced network length and from an OPEX from your reduced heat losses and from your reduced costs of servicing outweigh um, any reduction in in revenue from sales. Uh, so the key the key takeaways from this um, I think I'd like to to finish up on um, so as I've been mentioning throughout external HOUs remove the access barrier to maintaining 
good network performance. Um, and they also reduce your network length by about 65%. Um, and these, these operational benefits are um, kind of a fairly significant way of enabling a lower heat tariff um, and a, also a much lower overheating risk as well. So much you're improving resident comfort, both from a financial perspective and also from a, a physical comfort perspective. Um, this is a very good way of de-risking your design against uh, both pressure risks um, by removing that uh, high pressure pipework from dwellings and also against pending legislation. So the BC and the, the heat network market framework coming through. Um, and as you saw in the, in the, the two graphs just now, um, apart from in the most uh, expensive areas in the country, so in a vast majority of the country, external HOUs are likely to offer life cycle cost benefits over internal HOUs. But the one thing, and if this is something that you're kind of considering or would like to include on future projects, um, the decision needs to be made pre-planning kind of as early as possible to specify external HOUs before the building layout is fixed. Um, and that's everything from from me. So thank you for listening. Great, thanks a lot for that, Tom, Claire. Um, we've got some questions that have come through uh, through the Q and A. Um, first question: Do external HIUs have an impact on the cold water system in the development? Um, yes, so quite a quite a significant one, actually. Um, from so two from two sides of this. Um, so when you're, you're decoupling um, your hot and cold water systems, um, so you no longer have LTHW running through uh, corridors, which means the heat losses from um, your heat network are no longer a heat gain into your cold water system. So it's improved um, cold water delivery times, improved cold water temperatures, and improved comfort from that perspective. And it also, um, especially within London, the, the Thames water requirement of accessibility to water meters, which is why we see typically the several parallel runs of cold water pipe work in developments. Um, those water meters can be moved into the HOU cupboards, which means you can still access your meters communally, but you can now have one communal cold water pipe run uh, running throughout your um, each floor. And that's another fairly significant saving in terms of um, pipe work because you're, remo you're removing a lot of your cold water pipe work and turning it into one, uh, one communal lateral run from several individual runs. Yeah, just note on that. Um, we ran some numbers on that and it was, a, it was as much as 300 pounds per dwelling in terms of reduced cost by going down that, which that wasn't factored into your analysis, was it, Tom? No. Okay. Um, second question, how do external HIUs change the construction and commissioning process? <clears throat> um, so on top of, on top of just the, the financial benefit of reducing the amount of pipe work, less pipe work also means uh, during the construction process, it's less, few deliveries to site, less, uh, less waste, fewer, um, faster install time, less works, less hot works. So from a um, from a kind of a construction safety and program point, it's really makes things quite a lot easier. Um, and then during the commissioning process as well, the fact that you have access to HOUs even after you hand over the dwelling means that where you're tight against handover deadlines or you're running in um, phased handovers, you can continue to uh, optimize your commissioning process and also um, uh, manage your water um, water quality and water treatment, which I know is going to be discussed later on. That all becomes much easier because you can access the entire your entire network even after handover. Claire, do, do you have anything to add on that one? Um, well, just in just in terms of uh, construction, I suppose um, we don't see that it changes construction other than um, just that external access door um, or it. You know, it could be an internal riser door if it's got a corridor attached to it. So really, really, it's a pretty, pretty simple process from our, our point of view. It's just about the location. Okay. Um, another question: What does removing high pressure pipe work from dwellings do to your hy hydraulic strategy? 
Um, so I kind of touched on this ever so slightly um, throughout the, the presentation, but um, external HIUs mean that you have no, there's, there's no LTHW pipe work in dwellings. So when uh, designing from a hydraulic perspective, the uh, the pressure risk to residents is almost completely removed because you no longer have that pipe work in ceiling voids in flats. So your the pressure kind of delimiting factor is now pressure um, kind of equipment pressure ratings rather than safety. So if you look at typical ESCO, so we'll say above six bar, that's kind of their their limit of where they're comfortable having of pressure in dwellings. Um, you can really you can push that up to sixteen bar quite easily with um, uh, when you're just looking at equipment pressure. So that's an extra ten bar before you need to start thinking about hydraulic brakes. Um, which I think we looked at the numbers as an extra, it's about 25 floors uh, vertically before you need to consider putting in heat exchangers, um, which means, so that's a, a, a capex saving your plant room and also is extra space that you're reclaiming from that can be used for communal or commercial um, use. Um, question from Gabrielle Firestone, Camden Council. I think you touched on this, but what's the work involved to move an HIU from inside a property to outside? What kind of cost is it? So where, where are the costs within this? Um, so the, 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 main, the main cost really, or the main cost in, in my analysis was the actual, the actual value of the 0.3 meters squared. Um, that's a kind of a, especially within London where the, the price of land is very high that um, even kind of such a small area can have quite a significant impact. Um, there were also, so there are some costs also associated with the cupboard. So you've got an extra door, an extra lock per cupboard. Um, but from a, um, from the construction point, all of those cover costs are quite significantly outweighed by the reduction in pipe work length and the capex saving from um, not having to procure and install that pipe work. Um, so the real, the, own, the, the only kind of real downside was that the value of that land. And that's why the, the kind of the discussion um, about how to incorporate that, um, that, that value into the overall financials of a development are the, you know, if, if someone, the answer to that question would really unlock this. Kind of, if there was a way of reclaiming that value somewhere else or kind of uh, kind of, inc kind of increasing the value of the dwelling to account for that reduced area, you know, per square meter, that would really kind of unlock the doors to roll this out. Great, thanks for that. Um, just there was a there was a question from Jason Crawford, City of London, with residents who won't give access. If maintenance issues are impacting other residents through higher charges, can you place non-access residents on a higher tariff? Um, I'll respond to that. Uh, you can, you need to manage it very, very carefully. Um, there are people who have been through that process. Um, more than happy to have a discussion about that. Um, Tom, Claire, thank you very much for coming on today. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next session that we're on to um, is water treatment, looking at closed system water treatment. Um, so, we have today to talk about this, we have Pete Horn, consulting engineer at Fairheat, Ellie Hiscock, a graduate engineer at Fairheat, and John Pepps, who's M Pets, who's M &E service manager from Telford Homes. Um, so if the three of you could unmute and put your videos on, that'd be great. Okay, hi guys, uh, I'm Pete. Um, today, gonna be chatting a little bit about um, water treatment, um, particularly in line with, uh, what's happened here? Are you clicking through it? Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, gonna take you through uh, water treatment over the next sort of 20 minutes or so, um, particularly um, highlighting why water treatment is so important and what goes, um, what goes wrong, uh, what Fairheat's involvement is 
um, to ensure that that water treatment is upheld and that water quality is maintained throughout your system. Um, going to hand over quickly to uh, John to talk about um, the contractor engagement and the importance of that, particularly in um, the pre-commissioning process um, and uh, a little case study on um, where that's gone particularly well. Um, then Ellie's going to take on, um, uh, take you through some legacy sites, um, what we do to um, maintain water quality through there. And then um, I'm going to uh, take a little um, discussion on um, how we can improve water quality monitoring um, in line with my graduate project, which um, was conducted um, in 2019 and 2020. Um, do I need to... oh. There we go. So um, first one is uh, why is water treatment so important? Um, and the sort of overarching factor is that it is a protection of um, the investment, the significant investment that has been um, incorporated into a district heating scheme. Um, obviously we want to minimize corrosion through um, chemically induced and microbiologically induced um, factors and um, minimize these as much as possible. Um, the sort of down um, down the line, the, the sort of uh, increased factors that we see due to poor water quality um, significantly raises uh, the maintenance costs um, throughout a project lifetime. Um, so forced HIU servicing, um, which is often met with, um, you know, residents' discomfort um, and a lot of residents uh, refusing access as well, um, which Thomas has briefly mentioned. Uh, and um, block strainers throughout your network. I have seen um, in the last couple of months actually a plant room with um, primary valve sticking, um, which dramatically reduced um, the plant room efficiency um, of your boilers due to high return temperatures. It's just not controlling very well. Um, and then knock on effect to that was um, yeah, increased tariffs, um, resident discomfort, resident, um, poor resident satisfaction, um, and yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, here's an example of what happens if we don't have a pre-commissioning process in place. Um, this was a site that we visited. Um, we did find out um, almost immediately that the system was filled and then left stagnant for four months. Um, periodic testing um, had not been taken um, throughout the, the ongoing process and there were significant uh, remedial actions required which incurred very high cost um, reflushing, uh, biocide dosing, um, lots of attention to maintain circulation, um, strainer cleaning, um, all primarily because there was a breakdown in the process from the outset and that's what I want to really highlight um, throughout this sort of first section is that the process needs to be implemented um, and it needs to be ensured to, to get the, the best water quality we can get before anything um, does go wrong. Um, so that's primarily what, what Fair Heat are uh, sort of targeting um, to do. Um, we go through a sort of set process uh, from the word go, which is um, review, reviewing of method statements. We take an iterative approach to this. Um, so ideally sort of like one or two back and forth with the water treatment specialist to make sure that we get all of the um, guidance and requirements um, included within that method statement so that we can then use the method statement as effectively a Bible through the rollout of the process. Um, so we're looking to uh, ensure that flushing, um, flushing velocities and um, dosing and um, various on-site documentation are um, con conducted and completed um, throughout the flushing process. Um, we do go on site to uh, witness that and also um, sam witness sampling 
um, in line with British standards is what we're looking for. Um, and within that method statement, we are looking um, to get the results of those samples in line with the um, target acceptable limits um, that have been defined in the method statement. Um, throughout ongoing sampling, we're looking for um, trend ana analysis. Um, that's to maintain a proactive approach over a reactive approach. Um, and we really want to make sure that any issues that do come from the uh, samples um, are sort of dealt with before they become a major issue. Um, on the sort of back end of this process, um, we do review um, flushing documentation and certification um, and yeah, go, th go through, just make sure that all of that paperwork that um, was, conduct was, was conducted throughout is, is present and complete. And we also take particular note with um, bacterial samples, as we know that uh, a number of these, um, particularly microbiological um, sample results may not be um, complete. Um, so again, just want to reiterate the, the importance of that method statement. Um, we want a clear identification of the process adopted. Um, we're starting to see a lot of uptake in the closed system filtration flushing um, over a flush to drain um, methodology. Um, I personally um, do prefer that um, filtration flushing process. I think it's um, got a much um, a lot of benefits that do actually help the water quality in the first place. Um, we want clarity on all acceptable limits, um, whether that be through fill water quality, uh, measurements to confirm removal of um, cleaning chemicals, your seven day validation sample with um, particular interest to inhibitor levels. Um, so we want minimum and maximum inhibitor levels um, throughout. Um, that's to make sure that overdosing doesn't become a problem. We're very aware that underdosing is a problem, but overdosing um, also can um, have significant risk on your system. Um, just on the right-hand side, um, you've got two um, outtakes, one from BG29 and one from CP1 2020. Um, there's a bit of a um, sort of misalignment in the, in the chloride levels here. Um, and chloride can um, increase the risk of corrosion. Um, and we want to maintain and limit that as much as possible. Um, chloride can only really get into your system through um, your fill water line. Um, and particularly in London, um, chloride levels are between 60 and 80 milligrams per liter. So that CP1 2020 at the bottom of less than 100, um, we would always opt to go for that over at 250 milligram per liter as stated in BG29. Um, again, we just want uh, a clear process outlined in our method statement. And another key point um, just at the bottom there is a clear description of where the water treatment specialist scope ends. Um, so that has to be determined between the M&E contractor and the water treatment specialist. Um, but we want clarity from the word go so that we can maintain um, accountability throughout the water treatment process. Um, just going to hand over to John now. Um, he's going to take you through some contractor engagement. Thank you, Peter. Um, I know uh, Water treatment is probably not the most glamorous uh, part of a service in installation, but it's uh, it's actually a vital part of making the system work. If the system is all just sitting there, nice empty pipe work, we're not going to get any heat. So the, the water in the network is is really the lifeblood of the system. So we want to keep that as healthy as possible. Um, communication is the key very early in the project. Although it's, the water treatment doesn't really come into effect once the system is filled and commissioning starts. To get the requirements spelt out at the very start when the consultants are putting together their specifications and briefs uh, so the m and &E installing contractors know exactly what is expected and required of them is vital. Um, quite often we might see consultants just stick a, a one line in saying that systems will be flushed and treated. They might make a reference to BG29 uh, but we, 
look for a little bit more detail on that, a little bit more clarity to uh, the installing contractors so they know exactly what's actually required. So if we get a, a decent brief to start with, uh, then we look to the contractors coming up with detailed meta statements of how they're going to carry out their flushing processes and uh, ongoing water treatment. And we study those meta statements in detail, they give us assistance on those, uh, looking at the detail, commenting if anything needs to be tweaked. And basically the key there is, is getting, the, getting the systems right to start with. Um, if, it's, if it goes off in the right foot, we've got the flush correctly and the water treatment regime is, is um, initiated at the right time, as soon as systems are filled, it's a lot easier to keep them within limits rather than having a problem and trying to uh, dose, shock treat or uh, reflush in the worst, worst case. Um, the other thing, we get uh, the, the test results come back, we get a nice certificate, with a load of numbers on it, plus and minus figures. And it's not always the easiest of things to read. Um, most of us on this call, I'm sure there may be a few water treatment specialists out there. Most of us won't necessarily know the numbers off the top of the head as to what is required. So getting the, um, the test certificates with a, almost like an executive summary, a, a dummy's guide to what's happening is, is a useful thing. And also tracking those results as well. We look for um, water treatment tests to be carried out fortnightly as soon as uh, systems are filled and circulating and basically monitor those results fortnightly and if it can be demonstrated in a graphical form you can see straight away um, how trends are going. I think we'll have a slide in a minute which goes an example of that. Um, if, it, if everything settles down and it's uh, all within limits for uh, a couple of months at um, fortnightly intervals then we may stretch that out to monthly intervals. But again on each one of those months if things start to head into a uh, out of uh, out of kilter, moving out of acceptable limits, uh, then we would look to try and make uh, remedial works, dosing accordingly to bring them back into line before it goes out of uh, out of out of spec. Um, so, again, to categorise again, if we can get it right to start with, it saves a lot of hassles later on. Um, the water quality does have a, a drastic effect on the efficiency of the systems, as, as Peter mentioned. We could get uh, clogged valves, clogged outside HIUs, and it does increase wear on pumps and other moving parts within the system. And if it goes uh, drastically wrong, then the pipework can deteriorate very quickly. Particularly a word of warning, anybody out there that's got any carbon um, pipework installed, it's uh, a, a nice cheap lightweight option easy to install but you have to get the water treatment spot on with that because within very short periods um, the, the welds can be attacked and um, the uh, bacteria can affect the pipework and it can pinhole very very quickly so I can't uh, quite like that one enough. Um, can we jump on to the next slide Peter? Thank you. This is an example of, uh, it's one of the, the Telford Homes projects, I believe, that uh, Galleon's reached down in East London. Um, we had a, a very good contractor on that one who did the install and was on top of the water treatment from, from day one. Uh, the couple of graphs there show the um, dissolved and total ions uh, with graphically shown with the maximum and minimum limits. Obviously, there's no minimum limit, but the maximum there. As you can see from the the, the dotted lines on the curves, they were tested at, at regular intervals. I think there was probably a few more um, points because we were certainly testing at fortnightly intervals earlier on. And as you can see where there was a, a bit of a spike there in um, sort of April time, it started elevating up through to through May and June. We spotted that before it got to critical out of limits and we were able to do uh, remedial works to, to bring it back into line. And now it's, it's chugging along sitting there quite nicely. Um, that particular project was connected to a, a, an Eon ESCO supply with an external district heating network. ESCOs are particularly hot on um, water treatment. So although you may have a, you'll have a plate heat exchanger and the downstream side of which is, is within your control, you may have elements of primary pipe work where you're connecting to valves, etc., from the ESCO before it's got the hydraulic separation. And the ESCOs will be all over you, making sure that you've got the correct flushing procedures and water treatment in place, um, cleaning their section of the pipe before it's all opened up to their system, because obviously they don't want to risk contaminating a, a whole wider network, um, which could 
result can cause damage to, uh, to multiple properties. So, um, yeah, the, the graphs there that show the, the trends. Um, we would have look for grass, not just for iron, but for um, inhibitor levels, pH, the whole, the whole gambit. And then it's a, a bit of a, a water treatment guide for dummies. People like pretty pictures. So if you've got people on site who aren't water treatment specialists, but they can see a graph is going out of uh, between, out from between the red lines, it can be a red flag, and they can uh, elevate that to uh, the maintenance department and so people could understand what's actually going on. Um, so it's, as I say, the, the water treatment is it's the lifeblood of the system. Without it, if it falls out of, uh, out of limits, it can cause multiple problems. And although it's, uh, it's not the cheapest exercise to undertake, it is an essential one. If you get it wrong, it will cause uh, a lot more hassle and expense. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, so Fairhaven Heater engaged with a number of operational sites. Um, we provide continuous support to ensure that water quality is maintained and ensure that routine network monitoring is carried out in line with um, BISRIA and British standards. Um, so water samples are taken across site on a routine basis, um, which may vary from site to site depending on the network size or its um, previous water quality history. So if there were maybe previously known issues then a site may require more um, additional testing until this is resolved. Um, so we typically carry out um, quarterly visits, which include on-site chemical analysis, which will monitor things like pH, um, alkalinity, um, inhibitor levels, as well as recording the status of water treatment equipment, um, such as whether it's um, online or offline. Um, but these visits will also include an annual microbiology sample, which is sent off to the lab. And these are only really required annually as provided that there is no previous bacterial growth detected. Um, then due to the fact that it's a closed system, it's relatively a minimal risk that it will suddenly appear. Um, but from results obtained at the site, we then carry out trend analysis to see how the system may have changed from previous visits and then provide a summary report with um, recommendations. But what we essentially do is provide a bridge between the water specialist and the client. And then this includes from raising like more simple is issues such as isolated equipment to providing more in-depth analysis and consulting with the water specialist um, to resolve any issues going, going forward. Um, and we found that this process um, is good for maintaining continuous contractor engagement and providing a log of the water quality and how it's um, being maintained. Um, next slide, please. Um, so monitoring multiple parameters will often highlight cause and effect. Um, so for example, on one site, and we were, we were monitoring um, consistent acceptable levels of pH and alkalinity. Um, but when we actually came to reviewing the water treatment equipment, it was found that the M1 had been isolated. So we were able to flag this back to the maintenance contractor um, and ensure that this was um, reinstated. Um, another sort of issue that we've um, will flag on site is like high levels of water hard hardness. Um, it's typically associated with systems that have higher levels of makeup water um, being added to the system. Um, so our recommendation is typically to install a pretreatment plant on the boosted cold water that's entering the system, um, such as a water softener. Um, but sometimes systems do just um, require more makeup water than others, um, but significantly high levels um, could indicate a leak on the system. So we had another um, network that was flagging high levels of um, water hardness. And when we monitored this against other parameters, it was found that um, there was also falling levels um, of inhibitor. Um, and when this was flagged with the maintenance contra contractor um, and they had been redosing the system, this sort of pointed towards the potential for a leak. Um, and we um, recommended that they installed a water meter um, on the makeup water. And this became part of our monitoring to flag how much um, was being added to the system. Um, and then the final point on this is sort of, we found trend analysis really useful, especially for um, like issues where we've had previous um, corrosion problems and um, an individual result has flagged that it's slightly outside of the limit, but we've monitored over a period of time that it's a negative trend. We've been able to confirm with our water specialist that there is no ongoing corrosion. Um, so yeah, we've had really good engagement from that. And yeah, thanks.
your music tape. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so a, a common theme throughout this has been trend analysis, which is what we obviously look for to, to highlight issues before they arise. Um, however, um, I want to just highlight that um, as network temperatures are likely to uh, reduce um, through ambient loops or um, heat networks um, just becoming more and more efficient as we look to, to make um, decarbonize the heat, um, we might get to a point where bacterial issues start to proliferate at a much quicker um, rate. Um, and I just want to highlight that fortnightly testing during pre-commissioning, um, although might be good enough now, um, may not be good enough in the future. Um, and the same with quarterly testing for, for BG50 as well. Um, and it may start to create this, um, make this proactive approach that we're trying to adopt um, a bit too slow um, and turn it into a reactive approach, um, which obviously we don't want to happen. Um, just, there we go. Um, just want to highlight the um, availability of continuous water quality monitoring, which was my graduate project. Um, so during my graduate project, I effectively looked at the importance of every single um, performance indicator within the water quality um, sort of analysis area um, and highlighted that the four that you can see on the slides um, were the sort of most important. Um, there are a whole heap of benefits to sort of continuous monitoring of your system um, in the same way that sort of HIU um, continuous monitoring um, has been proven to be um, effective. Um, so we can pick up sort of chemical related issues um, almost instantaneously. Um, and it also moves water quality into a sort of data-based platform. So historical data can be stored away much easier. Um, it removes that sort of um, requirement for a paper trail um, throughout pre-commissioning, um, which, you know, contractors are busy enough as it is, um, it may be a benefit from that perspective. Um, and the reason I say um, it chemical related issues uh, is because we still may not be able to um, get that bacterial analysis sorted through the complexity of um, the, the biological metabolic pathways um, that nitrate reducing nitrate reducing bacteria and sulfate reducing bacteria tend to um, adopt um, further drawbacks um, are you, you're still going to have to increase your capex um, and there will be variability in your maintenance requirement and that's dependent on the monitoring equipment that you will use um, however um, in my project I did see um, significant benefits um, from a um, cost perspective. Um, and yeah, definitely something that um, I think should be thought about a bit, bit harder in the industry. Um, yeah, just one final point. So um, as we can't uh, monitor bacteria um, in the same way that we maybe can um, all of these chemical parameters, um, some level of sampling may be required um, and a hybrid approach um, may be bene actually beneficial for your system. Um, so thank you. That's it for me. And we welcome any questions. Right. Uh, I'll just take control of that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, so question from Wes Haley. Are you adopting the CPC option in the new BG29 2020 um, as, is ex as it is shown to extend pipe work life? Um, yes, um, we have worked on systems with the, the CPC approach. Um, we don't dictate that. Um, that's from the water treatment specialists um, perspective. We leave that um, to them. Um, we have been in discussions with... Um, Actually, Pete, do you just want to say what CPC is just so people are aware? So, yeah, CPC is a um, closed system flush. So um, what you're doing is you're filling your system 
from the word go with um, water that's dosed with um, chemical inhibitor. And then whilst you're flushing, you're adding um, uh, temporary filters um, onto various locations of your system um, and then um, ramping the pumps up uh, to run all of that water through these filters, gradually reduce the filtration size um, to a point where you should clean your system um, and remove all of the debris um, from it. So yeah, as I was saying, that is a, a sort of methodology that um, is dictated by the water treatment specialist we've used. Um, we've been on systems and been involved in systems that both use flush to drain, um, which we're totally happy to do as long as the methodology is there. Um, and we're also very happy to um, adopt systems and work on systems that do have this CPC approach. Um, but yeah. Uh, another one. Do you think, do you think um, deoxygenated and BDI 2035 compliance systems have a part to play in future heat networks? Um, yes. Uh, I've seen a lot of traction recently on um, this sort of the BDI process. It's been um, acknowledged in CP1 2020 and also in um, BG 29 2020. Um, for those who don't know what BDI requirements are, it's a German standard um, that adopts a deoxygenated system requirement, as well as reducing your um, mineral content within your water. So chlorides and sulfates and all other um, ions within your water, um, down to a point where um, the idea, the ideal um, scenario is your water effectively becomes inert um, and the, the sort of positive side of that is um, by making your water inert it can't react with your metal and reduces um, corrosion rates significantly um, in terms of whether i see it coming to um, the industry uh, at the moment um, I am hesitant to sort of recommend it. Um, and that's mainly because of the risk of catastrophic leaks during the pre-commissioning process. Um, and um, if that does occur, then your deoxygenation plant um, may struggle to uh, deoxygenate all of that um, air that is coming into your system. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just struggling on that, that point at the moment. Um, I think there definitely is scope to maybe make a primary circuit with all of your expensive equipment um, deoxygenated and then um, using a plate heat exchanger potentially have um, a dosed system on the other side of that. Um, but yeah, um, need to do a bit more thought on how we go about recommending that. John, do you have anything to add on that? Or? No, I think uh, I think Peter's covered it there. It's, uh, so, certainly as the uh, as networks change in the future, if we're going for ambient loops, then, then the risk is going to increase more than it is now. And um, yeah, the, it's, it's going to be a developing um, develop, developing industry. Um, certainly zero carbon, uh, sorry, zero oxygen systems that can be incorporated, but there's all the expense associated with that as well. Okay, I've got, got another question here. We're running out of time. Um, from the graphs on Ellie's slide, it looks like you adopted more stringent limits um, than BG29 or BG50 guidance. Why do you feel the need to improve upon industry guidance and how are those revised limits agreed? Um, so, yeah, so from that graph, so we didn't really feel that um, the BG50 limits um, uphold system water quality. So I think their limit is for total and it's 15 milligrams per litre and from previous experience and conversations with water specialists um, we kind of determined that if you've got 14 milligrams per litre in a system it's probably going to be in pretty poor condition um, so we agree these revised limits um, with contractors and clients and then we set these um, so that they can be maintained um, so we actually have a limit of um, one milligram per litre and then it means that as um, 
if this is recorded, like, and we can see like an upwards trend, this is gen generally flagged pretty much um, way before it gets anywhere near that um, criteria that's set out in BG50. Great. I think we're actually out of time on that, I'm afraid. Um, it is worth noting, I think this comes back to Pete's point earlier, there are some disconnect between CP1 2020 and B20, BG29 as, as well, with CP1 2020 generally having more stringent limits than BG29. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Thanks, John. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Ellie. Um, yeah. Move on from there. Thank you. So we're now on to a subject very close to my heart. Um, this has been somewhat of a personal crusade over the last um, few years uh, where we've seen a steady decrease in temperatures of heat networks um, of domestic hot water um, over time in particular. It's been a lot of time speaking to NHBC um, who initially had 60 degree requirements dropped to 55. I'm very happy to announce that we've now got the industry in, in a place where we have um, got cohesion or everyone to agree um, on a particular um, approach with HIUs with instantaneous um, domestic hot, hot water generation. So only res uh, responding to that. Um, want to invite Andrew Mackay, who's the um, uh, has actually been chairing the SIPSI um, Domestic Hot Water Working Group, which I also, also sit on, which Phil Jones mentioned earlier today, he's on as well. Um, welcome, Andrew. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here, and thanks very much, Gareth, for the introduction. Um, Gareth, I'm not sure I've got control of your screen. That's fine. If you just tell me, I'll, I'll flip through, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, that's a nice little introduction. So I'll, I'll launch straight into it, I think. So if you flick to the next slide, please, Gareth. Um, uh, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, the, the requirements for domestic hot water, but I think um, this slide kind of shows the, the, the big one for me really, which is um, one of the main reasons why we're doing it, which is the climate emergency and how that affecting everything that uh, that we need, that we previously thought we knew about our industry and how we and how we design. Um, so, uh, if you flip to the next slide, please, Gareth. Um, I, I feel like probably I'm preaching to the uh, the choir a little bit here, um, but these are um, a few um, diagrams that show the importance of what we're trying to do, um, particularly in the um, the communal heat um, domestic business so we have we have our target of trying to hit 20 uh, net zero by by 2050 as in the uk um, and uh as you can see from that top left diagram that's showing all of the energy that's used in the uk um in 2018 and around about 35 percent of that is is domestic so energy that's used in the home and one of the huge challenges associated with that is that a uh, big block, which uh, you might not be able to see if your resolution isn't big enough, but the, the biggest block in that domestic is 70% is of that is currently natural gas. Um, obviously, that's a, a huge blocker in terms of what we're trying to do in, uh, and moving the, the UK towards um, that net zero position in 2050. Um, the good news is we've, we've done a lot of work over the last um, 15 years as an industry. And uh, you can see in that top right um, diagram, this is a this is an actual specific project example of a, a development that Arup looked at, and um, where we were looking at interventions. Um, and on the left hand side, you see the chart of how um, we were expecting that development to use energy um, at, at, at its current status. And by bringing that up to modern standards of insulation and um, and air tightness, we move right the way across to that right hand block where we are at 25% um, of the total energy. But what, what you can see is that moves from being a space heating problem to very much a hot water problem. If you could go to the next slide, please, Gareth. Um, and at the same time, this is all happening. Uh, we're also, um, we've, we've moved 
uh, a huge way in terms of our culture and the way we use hot water. So slightly tongue in cheek uh, picture off on the left hand side, but that's where we were in London uh, 150 years ago, where we uh, either didn't wash at all or we uh, we had communal baths and very little people, very, very few people had the access to, to hot water. And we moved through a series of kind of technical innovations, um, moving to um, having uh, individual um, heat generation within within our own homes, whether that's um, back boilers on burning stoves or coal, or, or whether that's moving forward to um, gas boilers from from the kind of the 50s onwards. Um, but that was all based around hot water storage because we used to use a lot of hot water and use it quickly from things like um, laundry and, um, and and baths. Whereas now we're moving across to this what I might call the Scandinavian approach, um, where we uh, we might not all have saunas in our homes just yet. But um, we were predominantly a showering culture. Um, we don't use very much um, stored hot water for laundry any, anymore, and we're moving towards a, a world where we, we we're connecting as many low and and zero carbon sources to heat networks to generate heat for our space heating and, and hot water from a low carbon perspective as, as much as possible. Um, so next slide, please, Gary. Um, so to go back to the reason why hot water is really important is that it's not only the, ma the majority of the load, but also it's driving the temperature of the, 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 the heat network. Um, it's, we, can, we can use space heating down at 35 degrees if we wanted to, and um, we'd have some big emitters, but that would, that would be okay. We could get that to work, but actually we know that we need hot water to be a certain temperature, whether that's for function or for safety. Um, so that brings the, the temperature of the network right up. Um, which drives the heat losses and drives the technology that we use. Um, we talked a little bit about heat losses already, but um, you can see on that diagram on, and, uh, that you'd already seen on the, the Arab project, and actually that uh, heat loss becomes even more significant when we're down at a, uh, a, low, a low heat demand network. And so this is a start for um, that, that table there, which gives you a bit of a start into why we think this is really important. So just by dropping the temperature from um, hot water in a flat 55 degrees down to 50 degrees, brings our network temperature down by five degrees as well, and gives us straight away an 11% reduction in, in uh, heat losses through that network, which is um, a huge benefit. So you can move on one more slide, please. And it doesn't stop there. So we, um, I mentioned earlier that the hot water temperature actually affects the technology that we can use. And in a net zero um, economy, um, we need to be generating heating from electricity, um, not from gas anymore. So we need to be looking at heat pumps and heat pumps, the, the bigger the temperature difference between the water that we put in and the water that we take out, the harder the uh, compressor in that heat pump has to work. So more electrical energy in means more um, energy consumption. So the lower we can bring that temperature down, uh, the less hard the heat pump has to work. But actually, the, it's, um, there's, a, there's another technical barrier, which is the availability of refrigerants. So refrigerants have their own global warming potential when, they, when they're accidentally released. Um, they have uh, flammability concerns and all of these things mean that there are very few refrigerants that are available to use safely, particularly after 2025. And they also limit the, the, uh, the, the high temperature that we can achieve from heat pumps. You can see on the right hand side that diagram showing that just by again, by dropping that temperature by 65 degrees to 60 in terms of the heat network. So, so similarly, a five degree drop from 55 to 50 inside a flat you can get as much as a 20% reduction in energy consumption by those heat pumps, um, which is again, huge. So if we move on one more slide. And let's not forget about this one. Um, it might be something that is just an annoyance um, to us, um, but Limescale actually also, uh, other than reducing the lifetime of equipment. Um, it also has an impact on the energy consumption as well. And you can see here that just the 10 degree difference between 50 degree water and 60 degree water gives you a 20% increase in uh, the lime scale deposition. So the lifetime of your HIU goes down, your, your TMVs inside apartments, but, uh, your other plate heat exchanges that you've got elsewhere in the heat network require more maintenance. Um, all of that adds up, but at the same time, you also get a reduction in performance across plate heat exchanges and also on uh, your heat generating equipment, whether that's a heat pump or something else. So we skip on. Um, but 
we know we know that hot water temperature is also very important for um, the safety of the users. Um, and that's for two reasons. Uh, one of which is scalding. Um, so the table on the right hand side, I think, is 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 very interesting and talks about the different uh, amount of time that it takes for you to get a severe burn uh, with the exposure to different temperatures. And the, the column that interests me most is 50 degrees and 55 degrees, and particularly that, that bottom row where it's the difference between a child receiving a, a second degree burn is 45 seconds at 50 degrees and just three seconds at 55. So that's that's really the difference between a child screaming out and getting some help uh, if, they're, if they're immersed in hot water um, and an adult coming from the next room or, uh, or a child experiencing some um, significant trauma. But Legionella is also very important and uh, is, a, is an ongoing issue in, in the UK. Um, so we've done a lot of work with HSE as part of the um, Sydney Hot Water um, Working Group. Um, and we've been through guidance and we're very happy that um, HSE's guidance on, on uh, preventing Legionella allows us to use a 50 degree hot water temperature in the environment that we're, we're talking about, which is very specifically um, HIUs and generating hot water instantaneously in a, in a typical domestic setting. Um, so the reason that that 50 degree is, is acceptable is really to do with the, the, the low storage that's in, in that system. So there isn't enough hot water to generate a viable population of, of Legionella bacteria. Um, and so 50 degrees is ample temperature for us to use that hot water safely um, and also potentially improve safety. Can you move on one more slide, please? But what about what we actually use the hot water for? Um, so these are these are the two main reasons I think that we we worry about hot water temperature is is it going to take ages to fill my bath, um, and uh, actually it will take longer than if you have a hot water storage tank. Um, but what we're not talking about here is a comparison with a hot water storage tank. We're talking about a comparison in a, in a new build. Um, to other types of, of technology that would be used. And when we're talking about new builds, we're talking about a, a, a flat that's got a, a TMV that's limiting that temperature for safety reasons to 48 degrees. So really the difference between 55 and 50 makes absolutely no difference to the ability of you to fill up your hot water, your bath quickly. And is 50 degrees hot enough to do your washing up with? Is it hot enough to, uh, um, to uh, remove grease? And I know that Gareth can talk at length about this. Um, and uh, probably be very happy to later. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, the answer is, um, and it's the it's it's above and beyond the temperatures that um, the soap manufacturers expect their uh, their their products to be used at. So fifty to five degrees is too hot. You can't really put your hot, your hands in it. Fifty degrees is definitely hot enough. And actually, when we compare that to what people are doing when they've got free choice um, out in the uh, out in, the, out in the field. Uh, Energy Saving Trust did a study of uh, um, combi boilers across the UK and looked at what um, temperature they were set at. And actually the majority of them, more than 50% of the boilers were set to deliver hot water at less than 50 degrees. So as a, as a country, we were already more or less happy with it. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Gareth. So what have we been doing in terms of the hot water group is um, we've been aligning our uh, reviewing all of the standards available, reviewing the technical requirements and the safety requirements uh, and trying to align that. And as Gareth touched on earlier, trying to consolidate it and influencing the industry to somewhere where we think is best practice for safety and best practice um, for our future ability to um, uh, mitigate the climate emergency. Thanks, Gareth. Great. Um, and I'll just add to that. So under CP1 2020, and this is actually also coming out from the CP uh, from the SIPSI Domestic Hot Water Group, there is a requirement to generate hot water at 50 degrees, um, that you are able to generate 50 degrees. Um, based on conversations with HSE, it's, it's really important to emphasize this is for the specific um, use case. But what we're talking about here is effectively they're similar to point of use devices and they're considered to be a low risk um, of Legionella from, uh, from that perspective. So low risk systems. And when you're looking at balancing 50 degrees is sufficient as a generation. This just comes back to one of the points um, that was asked in an earlier session around 50 degrees within 60 seconds at the tap actually isn't a requirement. 
it's a requirement that you generate at 50 degrees from the HIU. Um, and that's one thing to be really clear on. One of the things that came out of that was, well, okay, at that point, there isn't a time requirement on temperature that has to be delivered to the end point. And it's felt that it's actually really important to come in with a, uh, on that to have something around the uh, customer um, comfort perspective. So we now have under CP1 2020, a requirement of delivery of 45 degrees domestic hot water to be achieved within 45 seconds. That's minimum requirement 3.4.17. Um, and the rationale for this is as Andrew showed in his slide earlier in that table, actually 45 degrees is functionally hot. It's the point at which scalding can occur um, and it will take a long time, but it is actually painful to touch. Um, so from a functional perspective, that's actually hot and that's a sensation that a customer will be getting. Um, coming back to the traditional approach, it's, it's more of a equivalence to 50 degrees in 60 seconds. And there's anecdotal evidence suggests that this is a flex point for complaints. Um, conscious on time. Um, so we're balancing off that 45 degrees within 45 seconds. Um, we've got a requirement at the same point in time for reduced flow rates to be used in building regulations. Um, in particular, if you look at part G, um, uh, there are optional requirements under part G. Um, we tend to see those being used in localities where heat networks are more prevalent. And if you just apply this, there's a standard um, table that you can apply to use those. You see that uh, kitchen sink taps, for example, tend to be around uh, is six liters per minute as a maximum. Um, you can obviously do your own calculations to go above that if you make flex to other areas. But what we're seeing is that actually quite often in practice, trodos and flow rates being used where actually people are going below the six liters per minute because they're trying to get a higher shower, for example. We've been doing acceptance testing, so we, we pioneered acceptance testing. It's great to see that that's now in CP1 2020. We've been doing it for five years. We've actually been doing the testing of 45 degrees within 45 um, seconds for five years now. And we've actually found that the failure to leave that, to meet that 45 second target is the single largest problem that we've identified. Um, issues around that are pipes are generally oversized. Um, so don't account for lower flow rates so people haven't made that change in design and also we've seen that plumbing outlets are often um, plumbed in series so you go through to a bathroom of a, of a large diameter and then go off for example to kitchen sink from there which that adds a significant volume of water that needs to be cleared at each drop off uh, at each draw off um, i'm not going to go into here alternative approaches have got inherent inherent issues on heat networks i won't go into that recirculation really wouldn't be advised. And trace heating in practice, we've seen a number of issues around Legionella, um, somewhat ironically, where poor, poor installations leading to higher temperatures being maintained um, in pipe work. And it also leads to overall higher energy use. So what we need to do is move away from that and actually look at how we design in tertiary domestic hot water pipe work. Um, and we're suggesting we take a different approach. First thing, we need to reduce pipe, pipe work um, sizes to size pipe work based on flow rates um, and distance and push to higher velocities. And then we'd also really strongly recommend moving to a uh, domestic hot water manifold approach where you're minimizing the volume pre-manifold and then running a single pipe to each outlet and sizing that pipe to the flow rates that you need for, for that outlet. Um, manifold approach, um, what we look again, I mentioned it before, so we've got, we try minimizing, so less than half a meter um, between the HIU and the hot water manifold to minimize the volume of large bore pipe work that you have to uh, draw down each time to clear, and then individual pipe runs. Um, we look at what's influencing the, the um, factors on domestic hot water delivery times, really three issues. One is the HIU warm up period, um, time to generate hot water from the HIU, the Beza HIU tests uh, will actually show how long that takes. There's then time to clear the pipework of the cold water. So you look at the volume of water, so pipe length and diameter versus flow rate. And those are the two things that we normally see being calculated. There's actually a third element, which is the warm up time for the um, pipework itself. So there's a cool down effect due to 
thermal mass of the pipe wall. And that's not normally factored into calculations, but can actually have a really big impact. And it's quite difficult theoretically to calculate as well. Um, we did some, we carried out in situ testing to explore the impact of domestic hot water delivery time. So we got a whole series of different um, pipe diameters. We used two different manifold systems. Um, we varied flow rate and then pipe size and pipe length. And we recorded temperature readings every five seconds until we got a stable temperature. And we looked at flow rate and then we, we recorded a bunch of data for each test. Um, we used a standard setup. So there you've got, we've got pipe, we've got a manifold, and then we controlled flow rate at the outlet and measured temperatures. Um, I think, again, I'm being signaled on time. So I'll, I'll try jumping on. What we found is that short runs introduce minimum cool down effects. So this is um, internal diameter 14.2 millimeters at six liters per minute. And what you see is you get to 45 degrees in about 14 seconds um, uh, from that. So this is only five meters. So you've got down bottom time to clear the pipe with cold volume there, you're talking about eight seconds. Then you've got your HIU warm up time, about six seconds. So you're then delivering. If you then look at the same setup uh, for 25 meters, you've got the same time. So again, you've got the same HRU warm up time, time to clear pipework of, of cold volumes a lot longer. But the thing that a lot of people, again, not take into consideration is this big cool down effect um, of the pipe wire work, which has really increases delivery time. It's quite difficult to capture theoretically. So in this instance, 14.2 mil, which is similar to 15 mil, where you'd see the copper, you're talking about 40, uh, 45 degrees in 90 seconds. So double the time that you actually as a requirement under, sub -C, uh, under the CP1 2020. So I, I guess coming through highlights, what we've got here is looking on the left, we've got temperature on the vertical axis and we've got time in seconds. And then it's showing um, with again, this internal diameter of 14.2 mil. What we're finding there is, okay, at five meters, it's fine. But as soon as you start getting to 15 meters, 25 meters, you're not hitting time frames, And this is what we're seeing. Whereas if you're to step to smaller diameter on, so on the right, we've got internal diameter of 8.8 .8 mil. Um, you are actually managing to hit 45 degrees, um, even when you're going out to 25 meters. And interestingly, when we brought lots of people to site to actually come and listen to it, there's no audible difference in pipe noise uh, and noise between these, these two different tests. So that's really quite important. Um, also want to note that even at nine liters per minute on longer pipe runs, actually larger diameters can still be a problem. And again, you see you're meeting it just getting there on 15 meters, but at 25 meters, again, you're getting that problem, even at nine liters per minute, you're 45 seconds, you're not meeting. Whereas at 8.8 .8 mil, nine liters, you've got no problem, you get very short delivery times. And again, we're not seeing any audible difference between, pipe, um, between the pipes. So the key takeaways, um, cool down effect of pipe is significant and can lead to extended delivery times and long runs. Um, the traditional pipe sizes will tend, would lead to extended delivery times, will not be compliant with CP1 2020. Um, we would recommend taking a manifold approach um, with reduced pipe sizes. Um, you don't get noticeable issues with delivering the required flow rates on smaller sizes, even for long lengths. And there really is a minimal um, difference in audible noise across the pipe sizes. And the theoretical time to clear pipe is well represented by testing. Um, one other thing we want to note is off the back of this, um, when we went through the testing originally, the pipe work that we tested didn't actually have system RAS approval, um, which you need to have. Um, we then engaged with manufacturers off the back of that test and got a really good response from market. We've got two manufacturers who come through who now have system RAS approval for smaller diameter pipe work. We've got Upanor, um, 16 mil, 14 mil, and 12 mil. Um, obviously, those are the external diameters. So that also goes down to the 8.8 .8 mil that we're showing before. And main core has 16 mil and 12 mil. And we expect others to, to follow shortly. So it's really positive to see that response from the market. So questions. Um, 
I think you can handle this one, Andrew. The question from Dave Lancaster. Um, do you have any published analysis on the effects of limescale accumulation on the system performance, especially relating to energy efficiency? I think you covered that, yeah? Um, not specifically on the system performance, no, not at my fingertips. I'm 100% sure there has been um, in the past. Um, so it's more about um, uh, replacement is, is the, uh, and lifetime is the, the research that I've seen. But um, in terms of the efficiency of a plate heat exchanger when it's, um, uh, when it's uh, covered in lime scale, I, I don't have that data at my fingertips, I'm afraid. I don't know if you know anything, Gareth. No, I don't. I have to confess. But, um, but I'm sure it's out there and um, I might actually, um, have you've uh, uh, intrigued me, so I might do a bit of research and I think we're going to share some uh, uh, session answers after the session, so I might, I might follow that up. Um, next question, um, actually I'll follow on, I'll, I'll jump one. Um, question from Samantha Jones. Um, don't you need to set your HIU temperature much higher than 50 degrees to, to achieve 50 degrees at the, the tap? I'll let you give your answer, but this is, I think, something we see often, we, we saw a, um, quite a big design consultancy the other day was coming back and saying you need to set 55 degrees to hit 50 from your HIU to set hit 50 degrees at your tap. I think there are two parts to that. Um, one isn't actually a requirement to get 50 degrees at your tap, but I think under ENHBC they are looking to that. But Andrew, you, you've done figures on this. Um, I was going to refer back to your, your graphs that you were just showing okay. um, in the actually, um, if it's, I think, probably right anecdotally, and I've seen it on site, is that you do need to set things, and that's generally due to poor install, and that's what we're trying to move away from as an industry. Poor, poor design in terms of layout and, and long pipe runs and oversized pipe runs and poor installations in terms of um, getting the, the right amount of insulation on or not, um, and getting... Um, and getting that pipe run rooted in the right in in the right place as per the design, um, and actually, if you if Gareth's glass show quite clearly that um, once you've got that warm up out of the way, um, you are easily achieving fifty degrees plus or minus one or two degrees, which is well within the tolerance of of what we actually deal with in the real world on site. Um, so any any of our measuring equipment is going to be um, within that tolerance. So um, actually, we we can achieve that. And actually on that, we, we, we do analysis, we've done analysis on this, and it's actually, it is a fraction of a degree. If you think of the actual heat loss from a pipe versus you, you might be delivering 10, 15, 20 kilowatts um, of flow, what you find is that somewhere between 0 0.1, 0 0.2 of a degree, you'll get loss by the time you get stability between the two points. We don't have instrumentation which will actually measure that. And in practice, what you see is we will be setting to 50 degrees. Um, and it'll be very, very close. You won't actually be able to tell the difference. Um, next question, why not get 55 degrees from the heat pump on the system, increase your COP, then you only require 45 degree domestic hot water set point? Mm. So at some level, I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think, um, as an industry, I think we're more comfortable at 50 degrees because that is well above the band that we know that Legionella um, uh, um, propagates. That's not the right word. Excuse me, as I'm not a, uh, I'm a, a mechanical engineer, not a public health engineer. I'm not always got the right, uh, right words to my, at my fingertips. But, um, uh, but 50 degrees is at the, at the uh, in the range where uh, Legionella is killed, whereas 45 isn't. Um, so although the, the, the view of HSE um, is that an, an HIU in a typical application is a low volume system and therefore it doesn't require you to check your uh, temperature at, at, any, um, at any particular temperature. Um, we just feel that 50 degrees is the, the right position in terms of giving maximum functionality um, and, and maximum safety. I, I've got um, Marco Kosic in my ear at the moment. Um, I can hear him say, in reality, you can, there is nothing stopping you from setting 45 degrees. I think as an industry, we've coalesced around 50 degrees. If you do your Legionella assessments, um, you can go through and do that. And there are, there are examples elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, I've been shared data from Denmark from a scheme where they did drop to 45 degrees and then monitored Legionella consistently and they, they saw no problems with that. But I think from a safety perspective, the balance was felt to be between scalding and Legionella risk that 50 degrees was the right point to set it. Um, 
I'm conscious on time, so I'm afraid we're gonna to have to, there was just one last question, which was what are the practical considerations with respect to manifold domestic hot water systems? I think one point I'd just say is if you're going to go down that route, minimize the distance between the HIU and the manifold, and then do single and specify single pipe runs from the manifold to the outlet with no um, joins on it um, to minimize risk of leak. Um, and then go as small as you possibly can um, on the pipes to, to, for, from a resident comfort perspective. Andrew, thank you very much for coming on today. Much appreciated. Thanks very much for having me. I'm looking forward to the rest of the session. Thanks a lot. Okay, so another fantastic session, which I'm, I'm quite excited about, place heat exchanges and substations. So we've got a talk on standardizing place heat exchanges and control approaches um, at substations. And just as some background to this, we, we select this as a topic as it is something we've seen as an issue um, in the wild where we've seen big fluctuation in temperatures. So that's why we selected it and got it looked at. So as an introduction, we've got uh, three speakers today. So we've got Dan Staunton, who's a senior engineer at Fairheat, um, Lucy Sherbin, who's a uh, graduate engineer at Fairheat, and then Sula Fetus, who's um, Software Solutions Manager from um, Danfoss. Thanks all for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Gareth. Thanks. So. Yeah, okay, um, my, I can't quite get. That's okay, just tell me and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go with you, idiot. So as an industry, um, we're seeing an increasing need for, for plate heat exchanges. Uh, building heights are increasing, leading to higher pressures on networks. Uh, plate heat exchanges reduce those pressures, minimizing risk to residents and protecting plant equipment. As building heights generally increasing over the last five to 10 years, we're seeing and, and continue to do so, we're seeing an increased need for plate heat exchanges. Uh, next slide. Historically though, outlet temperature stability from plate heat exchanges has been, has been poor. So the data on, on, on the right hand side here shows the te secondary temperature um, flow temperature off a plate heat exchanger taken just a couple of weeks ago uh, from a site. During periods of low demand, so before around five o'clock in the morning, we're getting really quite unstable temperatures. The target outlet is um, 70 degrees, but it's varying between 75 and, and 60 degrees. As demand starts to increase, uh, sort of past six o'clock onwards, we start to see slightly more stable operation, but still fluctuating between 75 and 65 degrees. Historically, this has had a relatively limited impact on residents. Um, we've designed with relatively large approach temperatures between secondary flow temperatures and HIU outlet temperatures. So the scheme that this was taken from, um, whilst the plate was delivering at 70 degrees, um, the HIU uh, was only delivering 55 degrees to residents. The plate could therefore um, vary around 10, 15 degrees from set point without any impact on residents. Uh, next slide. However, the, the tolerance for poor control and poor stability is reducing. Um, we're moving to heat pump led heat networks. Uh, the impact on, on heat pump temperature uh, and needing, needing on, on efficiency, we're needing to drop temperatures. And whereas traditionally we would have had a 10 to 15 degree approach temperature from, from the secondary flow onto the HIUs, uh, we're now looking more towards five to 10 degrees to, to retain efficiency on the heat pump. If we overlay, like we have done on the right hand side here, the, the current levels of stability that we see, this is, I should say this is a fairly common level of, of stability that we haven't picked out a particularly poor plate heat exchanger. Um, you'll see that if we're trying to maintain a five degree approach temperature, we, we can't do that. So our current, our current approach, our current designs, our current controls don't provide adequate stability uh, for us to maintain um, comfort, domestic hot water and, and space heating um, continuously. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are a couple of root causes for this. We generally see peak loads still being oversized and, and the equipment being oversized because of that. Relatively limited consideration being given to part load uh, and controls being poorly optimized. There also isn't really a standard approach that's being co coalesced around as an industry. We had a quick look at the last couple of years uh, worth of designs that have, uh, that have used plate heat exchanges so from other consultants and, and, and clients. 
Around 50% used a duty standby approach, and 20% used the duty single plate approach, and another 20% used the duty assist approach, and then 10% of just of other design. There's no clear standard that's being used, and, and that's preventing lessons learned being taken forward into the commissioning and, and specification of, of, of plate heat exchanges of control valves moving forward. And that was that was the purpose of Lucy's Lucy's project. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, as, as both Dan and Gareth have mentioned, um, this topic was given to me as a um, graduate project where I was trying to solve some of those issues that Dan had discussed with the aim of identifying an optimal approach. Um, the model I developed investigated a number of different things. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about um, are brazed versus gasketed plate heat exchangers, um, sizing and selection of your plate heat exchanger, um, look a bit at load data and also um, look at the cost of different options. Um, some of those options we looked at um, included different size um, plate heat exchangers, so going at one size at 100% and smaller plates. Um, also looking at different plate heat exchanger arrangements, so the duty, duty standby or duty assist um, as well. Um, the, uh, the model used a three degree approach temperature across the plate heat exchanger. Um, this was used to represent a low temperature scheme or heat pump led scheme. Um, and I also used um, load data from a theoretical hourly load model, which was um, developed by Fairheat. Um, this uh, load model um, had four different scheme sizes, so going from 100 units to 1,000 units. So um, scheme size was also kind of investigated within this, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to look at the 250 unit um, size scheme. Next slide, please. So um, initially, I investigated uh, brazed and gasketed plate heat exchangers. Um, they're the two types we typically see in this industry. Um, and I looked to compare their flow regime across the yearly load profile. So just going back to the theory a little bit, um, your ability to transfer heat effectively depends on the turbulence of the medium. So um, high turbulence is really desirable. Um, laminar flow, which is kind of at the opposite end, uh, where you have low flow rates through your plate heat exchanger, um, gives poor performance, your velocities are reduced. This can, reduce, uh, can result in scaling and fouling on your plate heat exchanger can also increase the pressure drop across your unit. So this has a knock-on effect in terms of, of maintenance and um, lifespan and your ability to transfer heat effectively. Um, so we want as much turbulent flow as possible. Um, so using the hourly load model at each load point within that, I was able to tell whether the plate heat exchanger selected um, was operating at turbulent, laminar or transitional flow. And transitional flow is just the, the bit between the two, uh, the two there. Um, the graphs compared different size plates for both brazed and gasketed solutions. Um, and you can see kind of the breakdown of those different flow regimes across the year. Um, I think it's pretty clear to see that um, brazed plate heat exchangers provided the highest amount of turbulent flow um, in comparison to gasketed plate heat exchangers. Next slide, please, Garth. Um, so then looking more into brazed plate heat exchangers, um, I compared the flow regime of different scenarios. So as you can see on the graph here, we had um, one plate sized at 100% of peak load, so your duty scenario. We had the same again, but with, with a spare plate um, located in the plant room. This was kind of looking at the cost of that, really. Um, we then had duty standby. Um, we then looked at duty assist approaches. So um, two plate sized at 60%, two plate sized at 50%. We've kind of seen these before in, in industry. Um, and then we also thought to look at um, using almost like a jockey plate. So having a plate sized um, at sort of 20, 30 or 40% and then having, having a larger size plate as well. Um, so what can we see from, from the flow regime with this? Um, we can see that uh, duty plates and plate sizes at 100% um, give the, the least amount of turbulent flow um, and the largest amount of laminar flow. Um, so should probably be avoided um, when going forward. Um, next slide, please. So the symmetrical duty assist plate heat exchangers, um, they provided an improved performance. Um, so the two plates sized at 60% or two plates sized at 50%, um, the laminar flow uh, amount decreased and uh, the amount of turbulent flow increased as well. And next slide, please. 
um, we see that the asymmetrical duty assist plate heat exchangers, so those that have the jockey plate, um, provided the, the highest amount of, of turbulent flow and um, really limited the amounts of laminar flow. Um, so if we take a look at um, load data, um, yeah, that one, perfect. Um, we can kind of see why this, why this is the case. Um, this is operational load data from, from a site um, across the year of 2020. Um, the design peak load can be seen by the orange line at the top. Then you can see the, the, the power across, across the scheme. Um, we can see that actually for large portions of the year, you're operating at quite low loads. Um, and you are getting close to peak load during winter, but you're kind of not necessarily hitting that. Um, so takeaway from this is that your plates really need to be sized to operate efficiently over a range of loads. Um, and if you're having a plate that is sized at, at peak load and actually you're only operating at, at 10, 20% of that, um, you're gonna start seeing that laminar flow and, ha and have that reduced, um, reduced amount of turbulent flow. Um, next slide, please. We also looked at um, the proportion of year spent above a percentage of peak load. Um, so you can see with the above 20%, um, there was 55% of, of the year spent above 20% of peak load, but that also shows 45% of the year was spent below that. So large portion spent again at low load. But what's interesting about this is actually um, when you have a plate size that either like 50% or 60%, um, there's not actually a significant people, there's a very, very little amount of time spent above that. So um, actually using those size plates almost provides you close to full redundancy. Next slide, please. Um, we then, oh, I then looked at cost comparison. Um, so as you might expect, um, the GT standby provided the most expensive option. Um, and the duty assist options are kind of relatively similar in price to each other. There wasn't one that was significantly more or significantly less expensive. This was for the braised plate exchanger with um, a single pick valve. And next slide, please. Um, and just taking it back to comparing gasketed and braised solutions. Um, these are the different sizes of plates that were used in the model. Um, for those plates that are at lower size, um, braised was, was cheaper. But as, as the plates got, got bigger, um, they were actually really relatively similar in price as well. Next slide. So um, what can we, can we conclude from this? Well, it appears that braised plate heat exchangers give um, better flow performance overall. Um, but when you have larger schemes, um, consideration may want to be given for gasketed plate heat exchangers um, just because gasketed can um, can be uh, assembled in a plant room or disassembled and reassembled pretty easily. So if, if you've got a really heavy unit and a really your access isn't great, um, gasketed might be an easier solution because you avoid the need to lift heavy things um, and can get through access a bit easier. Um, plate heat exchanger sizing. Um, I think it was kind of clear that um, using a plate sized at 100% um, is probably not the way to go. Um, so that leaves the duty assist options, but, um, but which one? Well, theoretically using a jockey plate appeared to be the best approach um, in terms of flow performance, but we kind of haven't really seen this approach used on site or have experience with it. Um, so we need to kind of investigate and determine feasibility of using these asymmetrical plates. Um, so in the meantime, using a two plate sized at 50% appears to be the best approach, so the duty assist at 250. Um, this provided you with pretty low levels of laminar flow. It was ever so slightly the cheapest duty assist option. Um, the load data suggests it will provide near enough full redundancy, and um, we have established control methods for symmetrical duty assist plate heat exchanges. Um, should note that this is quite high level, and there are many project specifics that you should consider when, when choosing your plate sizes um, and what type of plate. Um, and control valve selection will play a major point in, in, in those stable temperatures, which was Dan was talking about at the start. So that kind of is still a major consideration. So, um, so on that, I'm going to pass over to Sula from Danfoss. Um, she's going to discuss the control valve side of things and hopefully provide some solutions to the issues we're seeing. 
Thanks so much, Lucy. Um, and it was great to actually see the, the difference between the heat exchangers there and the, and, and the work that you've put in. So thanks for that. So we could just go on to the next slide, please. So just sort of going back over a bit of the theory here, I guess. So let's see how we can achieve this perfect flow in a substation. So the equation that you've got on the left there requires us to control the K-phi and differential pressure in order to achieve a perfect flow. So without any valves in the substation, you're not looking at controlling anything at all. So the behavior of the substation would be completely unpredictable. As we install a motorized control valve, we gain the ability to control the KV, which is the valve opening uh, part of the equation there. Since the system is dynamic and the differential pressure is changing all of the time, this will in most cases give you a very poor control. And you can see that by the changing temperature in the graph at the top where the domestic hot water is coming from. With upgrading the substation with a differential pressure controller, we can achieve full authority over the flow control. And in most cases, we can achieve a perfect control. But there are still cases, um, however, where this is not possible. For instance, where you're looking at oversized valves or uncommissioned controllers. However, in those cases, the results with the motorized control valve will still be better than having no control on there at all. So in most recent years, we've looked at um, using PICV controls, which basically combine the motorized control valve and the differential pressure controller into one complete unit. Next slide, please. So with the use of our latest technology, which is the Virtus PICV and the autonomously controlled intelligent actuator, which is the ISET, you have the ability to change the differential pressure over the motorized control valve. And this ensures flow stability for high and low flows and with the added benefit of having a more compact design and added setting indicator. The split characteristics of the Virtus PICV offers improved control and higher accuracy. The intelligent differential pressure adjustment ISA actuator improves network efficiency by offering continuous auto commissioning and providing pump cost optimization and can offer predictive maintenance when it's being monitored. As you can see from the graph here, and this is a real life case study that, that we've been involved in, um, you can see the benefits of installing this technology. So you can see on the left hand side that there are big flow and temperature oscillations, um, and these are measured on the secondary network, as, especially during the low demand periods. You can see in the middle proportion there uh, where ISA has started to kick in and it's starting to lower the differential pressure control and oscilla oscillations. And it also shows on this right hand part of the graph where ISA is fully functioning. It's learned how the, um, it's learned the demand flows from, from the heat exchanger in the system itself. And it's starting to provide a much better comfort um, condition for the end, unit, end users. So this is the part that's being delivered into your tertiary side of the system. So ISET function monitors flow control signals from electronic controller where it detects a single uh, signal and is oscillating. And this is enabling it to st uh, stabilize the temperature control. It starts intelligently lowering the differential pressure on the flow control valve and consequently that forces it into a higher opening and out of non-authority range. If you can move on to the next slide, please. So, you know, using, using the correct valves is, is extremely important and understanding how they, they affect your system is also a really relative uh, and relevant point to consider. But also with the current situation that we all find ourselves in, I believe that data-driven approaches uh, and being able to remotely connect to your heat source to understand what's happening is an extremely important factor. So we, uh, Danfoss Lean Heat Monitor is, as its base, a monitoring and control solution, allowing you to have control over the heat transfer demand as well as the network and the production. So with the development of this solution, we looked at four main goals. So being open, connected and transparent, meaning that the software can connect with any device using standard communications. It offers easy integration and business intelligence and optimization solutions. In a simple term, it's plug and play. We looked at modern web-based cloud solution, which is constantly and always updated. So with the latest version automatically available to you, you can access it from anywhere um, on your mobile desktop or, or an iPad. And it's offering you state-of-the-art security uh, mechanisms for a safe and secure communication and data storage. 
this solution has been customized for district energy systems with easy integration on new devices. So as your network grows, you can add more, more um, devices to your network. The controllers are automatically commissioned and the solution can improve your network control and management with actionable information insights um, and seeing the improvement of your work efficiency of the actual um, network itself. And also by providing uh, this kind of solution and being able to use a data driven approach, it offers a reduction in your investment and maintenance costs. The software as a service will help lower your total cost of ownership and improve your return of investment by unlocking your resources to focus on your primary business. We can move on to the next slide, please. So with this intuitive software, you can access a wide range of functionalities. And it's so important when you're looking at um, the, the controllability of your, your product that you've got on site. So not only is selecting the right heat exchanger and selecting the right valve important, but actually understanding how they're working and how your system is operating. With this software, you're able to get a number of different functionalities, including maps, flow diagrams, real life data, understanding how, what your flow and return temperatures are and what you're actually delivering from your heating circuits and your domestic hot water. Um, you're able to download the files as CV um, files and you're also able to create charts and graphs so that you can actually prove and show how your system is operating. One of the most critical things, um, and this is something I think that, that uh, Lucy and Dan have, have looked quite a bit into, is that at the point of when you commission a heat exchanger or a substation, you're only ever commissioning to the um, standards of that particular day. And this is where obviously seasonal commissioning becomes far more important. If you're only able to commission on a specific day and it's five degrees outside, that doesn't give you a true indication as to how the, your system will operate when it's minus two or it's 25 degrees. Next slide, please. So just to show you how um, you know, looking at weather compensation when you're looking at your um, substation and heat exchanger is, is really, really important. And it's something that should be taken into consideration when you're looking at how you're controlling your, your substation. So as you can see on this graph, and it is quite small, so apologies if you can't see it properly, um, but you've got on, on this chart, um, the green line is showing you the flow temperature from the secondary flow. And the brown line is showing you the heat meter power in an in, in instant kilowatt. Um, so the weather compensator is saying that if the outside temperature drops, there is an increase in the kilowatt demand and the flow temperature. And when the outside temperature rises, there is less demand for power and temperature. So what this is showing is that without weather compensation, you would have a fixed flow temperature, which in 99% of the cases would be too much. By using weather compensation functionality, you start to create energy and money savings through your equipment. A minimum temperature can be set during weather compensation to ensure that your domestic hot water demand is achievable. And I know that the domestic hot water side of, of a network is so important. And in the previous presentations, you would have heard as to why that is. And while this appears, uh, weather compensation appears to be a very low level control, there are very few, very few systems that I see in the field that actually use this functionality of control. By using a data-driven approach and a smart software like Lean Heat Monitor, this would automatically be a function rather than something that needs to be manually set. Thank you. Great, thanks though all. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, I just come into those. Um, first question, actually, I'll, I'll jump to the second one now. Approach temperature is a uh, question from Oliver Butcher. Approach temperature is a new term to me. Could you confirm what this means in the system? Um, yeah, so approach temperature is the difference between uh, the temperature on your inlet on one side of your plate heat exchanger and the outlet on the other side of your plate heat exchanger. Um, so you, your primary flow and your secondary flow essentially. Um, is, is the difference there. So just, just to note that the, 
the difference in your approach across the plate will change the size of your plate as well. Yeah. So it may change the size of the frame, the height, the weight, the width, and the amount of plates that are involved. So um, I know that you use the, the three degree approach in your study, um, but primarily and, and more often on a heating circuit, we would see around five degrees. And sometimes on a, a chilled system, you'd see between two, one to two degrees. But a three degree approach is where a lot of designs are going to at the moment. Yeah, um, and, a, and a three degree approach is just purely as we go to lower temperature schemes, obviously that difference between what's coming out of our heat generation equipment and the temperature that's at the final point um, in your hot water, um, that is starting to kind of reduce. And um, yeah, it's proving that your, pl your plates need to be bigger and, and lots of other things as well. Yeah. Another question, what, what further consideration should be made when specifying the type of plate heat exchanger? And I think this comes back to what you were looking at before, Lucy, in terms of yeah. branded and gasketed. Yeah, so I think I kind of touched on this, this earlier. Um, gasketed plates can be um, assembled and disassembled, whereas brazed is, is a unit that can't be opened up and put back together. Um, so, yeah, like you said, if you if you have... Um, if you have a large scheme um, and you have really big units, it might be easier to have a gasket plate because you can assemble that in your plant room. Um, but other things to think about, um, what I found was when I compared it, gasket tended to weigh more when it was put together, needed a bit more floor space. Um, so that might be a consideration of how much floor, floor space you need. Um, again, with the reducing approach temperature, this tends to mean that you need a two-pass solution in your plate heat exchanger. So instead of having both your connections on, on one side, you have them on both sides. So that might be something you need to consider is whether that's going to increase your floor space again. Um, gasketed can be a bit more flexible um, in terms of adding and removing plates. If you were um, increasing the size of your scheme at a later date, that can be easily done. Um, again, with maintenance, uh, we can, I looked into what, what the differences in maintenance between the two. Um, and what I kind of got back from, from industry was, well, a well-maintained system, there should be little maintenance, but we all kind of know that systems aren't really well-maintained. So, um, but as we saw with gasketed, they weren't very efficient in terms of their turbulent and turbulent flow. Um, so if you have more laminar flow, it's, it's likely that your plates are gonna get scaling and fouling. So that might mean your gasketed plates are gonna be needed to clean more often than say, if you had a brazed solution. Um, so that might increase your maintenance costs. Um, and again, with gasketed, um, because your plates are sealed by gaskets, they often need replacement during during lifespan. So that's another additional thing you might want to consider is like the, the cost of replacing your gaskets at some point during the lifespan of the plate. Um, also, yeah, that needs to be considered as well. You don't really have that with a brazed solution. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's kind of various project specifics that you, you might want to think about when, when it comes to it. They're, they're really great points, Lucy. Um, and I would always say that um, there is, there, there should be as well on the, the rating of the, the kilowatt rating of a plate, there should also be like a, a level of where you move from a braised plate onto a gasketed plate, just surely because of the size and the weight of the units themselves. But, um, you know, like with a braised plate, if you're, you're doing sort of 400 kilowatt, the, the um, performance of the plate is better as a braised plate. And actually, when you look at the, the maintenance cost and the regimes for a 400 kilowatt gasket plate uh, and what you have to do in the future, it, it works out that the braised plate is more cost effective. I've got a question coming back. So Sula mentioned before the issue around, you know, obviously oversizing isn't only on plates, it can also be on valves and it can, and can have a really big impact. You looked at modeling different sizes of, of plates, um, Lucy. Did you also look at the impact of modeling, um, what the impact might be on valves? Yeah, I kind of looked into that. Um, it's, it proved to be a, a bit difficult in terms of um, manufacturers say they can control down to 1% of nominal flow. Um, so if that's the case, that's brilliant. The old flow should be able to be controlled well, but often we don't necessarily see that. And it's kind of determining whether that's down to, is that 1% accurate or not? There's actually when you're below 20% or 40% of flow, you might see the valve punting or oscillation, or is it maybe down to like the control logic um, and tuning and commissioning of the valve as well? Um, so that's kind of where I got to in terms of, trying to figure out what is actually causing that. Um, 
and kind of yet to be fully investigated. Um, so I'm going to be challenging this. Can, can, <laughs> yes. can we believe the one percent figure? Because I mean, just from anecdotally on site, looking at empirical evidence, that would yeah. appear to be the case. Yeah, I mean, there are there are a number of different factors with how a system performs. Um, selecting the right plate, selecting the right valves. Um, every manufacturer of a pressure independent control valve or motorized control valve whatever it is should be able to give you and supply to you as uh, industry um, testing sets that show how the performance of the valve will work you can control down to one percent and most manufacturers out there will tell you you can it doesn't explain the amount of oscillation that you may get through the system hence the reason why using um, an autonomous controlled uh, product would help with that because it takes a learning from the system and it starts to control based on the demand so using a technology that can take um, out that oscillation and that variant in there is really really important when you're looking at moving into these low temperature systems where you'll start to get different temperature approaches and and you're you're oscillating and and your system is fighting the other problem that we also see um and i know that lucy and i'd spoken about it previously before is where there's not um you know where, where you've got buildings that are being handed over and you've only got 30 percent residency and the system's been designed to 100 percent residency um, uh, you know, it's switched on because 30% of the there's occupancy in there. Um, the system's trying to deliver and it's been set and commissioned to deliver at 100% load and you don't need that. You're using excess energy and this is where you're getting higher pumping um, loads and your, valve isn't a, your uh, valves in the system aren't able to cope with that and that's where you get these oscillations. So using data-driven approaches and being able to commission, I guess, on a daily basis as to what your demands are are really important to running an efficient system. Okay, uh, we've got one final question and we've only got about a minute and a half. So quick answers on this one. Um, do you have any comments on rule of thumb sizing with respect to pressure drop limits set on plate heat exchangers? E.g. a very low pressure drop limit may be set which will lead to a, a high level of oversurfacing on the plate. Um, so yeah, I'm not necessarily a, a heat exchanger specialist, but what I came to find when I was selecting plates um, was obviously at these really low, uh, small approach temperatures, you needed a higher pressure drop to not uh, to be able to have to tr transfer heat at, at that approach temperature. Um, it, it was kind of improving impossible to have have a low pressure drop and a, and a small approach temperature to be able to provide a solution. Um, I'm not too sure on this whole oversurfacing and, and that sort of technical detail at, at the moment. Yeah, there are there are quite a lot of factors that you do need to consider when you're looking at the pressure across the plate as well. So um, there are a lot of designs that come out with like 30 kPa across the plate, which really changes um, the the amount of surface that you have in order to to get the heat transfer, like Lisa was saying. Um, 50 kPa is generally quite a nice figure around that point. You can get a plate that will be efficient and that will will work efficiently. So we try generally when we're selecting plates to select around the 50 kPa mark. Um, um, you know, we can select at 30, we can select at 20. Um, and again, it will also depend on the actual system itself and the pressure, uh, the pump pressure through the system. If you've got a 250 kPa pump right next to the plate, then you need to take that into consideration when you're making the selection. Yeah, I think it's, it's another kind of, it's all kind of project specific in a sense of what do you want for your plate and, and whether that's worked. Um, in terms of the model that I did, we used a 50 kPa um, pressure, pressure drop limit across the plate. That's all we've got time for. Uh, Lucy, Sula and Dan, unfortunately, has uh, internet crashed some of the times. Um, thanks a lot for coming on. Much appreciated. Thanks so Thank much. You. Cheers. So uh, our last session today, we're moving on to acceptance testing, um, which we're really proud of the fact that that's now got into um, CP1 2020 as a, uh, as a minimum requirement, having worked on it for a number of years and getting that um, pioneering the setup for that. Um, and to talk about that, we've got a larger crowd this time. We've got Freddie Valletta, lead engineer at Fairheat. We've got Alan Hassett, a consulting engineer um, at Fairheat. Ricky Stevens, operations director from Orchard Plumbing. And Paul Craig, m &E site manager from Telford Homes. Welcome all. Hi, thank you, Gareth. I'm just going to yep, request Welcome. control now. 
Has that gone through? Yep. There we go. Hi. Um, as Gareth said, um, we're going to be talking about acceptance testing. First off, we're going to just touch upon um, the new CP1 2020, as there are some new sections um, regarding acceptance testing involved in it. Then we're going to, Ellen and I are going to talk through acceptance testing from both an energy centre and a building level perspective, and then focusing on a dwelling level viewpoint, and then get some uh, perspectives from both the developer and the contractor side as to how their approaches have altered in order to include acceptance testing. Okay, so over to Ellen. Thanks, Freddie. Um... So heat networks play a key role in the decarbonisation of heat in the UK and the updated code of practice released earlier this year has been written to improve many aspects of heat network from design through to operation. One of the commissioning objectives in section 5.7 details the requirement for acceptance tests to ensure an efficient and reliable service is delivered. In CP1 2020, there has been a, a shift in focus to overall network performance rather than performance of individual components during heat network commissioning. So poor commissioning and performance of the energy center is often associated with unstable flow temperatures. In the past, there has been a tendency during commissioning to solely focus on achieving stable operation during peak load, despite part load conditions being more common during operation. This hindsight leads to unstable flow temperatures during part or varying loads, risking the reliability of the heat network. Uh, poor commissioning and performance of endpoints, such as heat interface units or fan coil units, is often associated with elevated flow rates and return temperatures, where a few poorly performing units can have a detrimental effect on the heat network's performance and efficiency. Acceptance testing provides performance verification of the energy center and all the endpoints, which Freddie and I will delve into further. Feedback is then provided to contractors for rectification. Um, this process ensures installation, commissioning, and operation are all as per design and performance specification and prevents issues and faults emerging during the early years of operation where their rectification would be more expensive and more intrusive. Next slide. So minimum requirements for that are outlined in CP1 2020 are as follows. Um, ensuring the acceptance testing procedure forms part of the construction contract. This is essential as it builds acceptance testing into the development process from day one. Uh, appointing a heat network specialist to carry out on-site acceptance tests. So these acceptance tests are testing the energy center with a focus on average flow and return temperatures, efficiency, reliability, et cetera. And then acceptance testing of dwellings, which includes an initial set of tests on a small number of dwellings to establish systemic issues that can be rectified before commissioning and testing the rest of the development. And then taking a graduated risk-based approach to the rest of the development. So that's testing the first 10% of dwellings and then a randomized 10% sample of the remainder. And if any of those fail to meet requirements, then a further 10% should be tested and so on. So the key outputs here are record sheets, a non-acceptance log and a summary report. On to you, Freddie. Cool, thank you, Alan. Um, as Gareth said, we're completely thrilled and proud that uh, acceptance testing has been included within CP1 2020 as a, a minimum requirement. Although our recommended approach is to take this step one further. Um, and basically our approach is to undertake the CP1 best practice. The best practice outlines that acceptance testing should be carried out over 100% of dwellings and endpoints. This ensures that correct service levels and design return temperatures can be achieved across the network. 
This way, the developer and client has the complete confidence that all installation and commissioning issues are addressed and, rec and rectified pre-occupation. Whilst you may be thinking that 100% of testing seems a bit overkill and uh, could impact on project timelines, it's actually the best approach to take, not just in terms of the results that it produces, but in terms of being able to budget and plan for this commissioning and testing phase of the works without any unknowns. The 10% plus 10% minimum requirement approach stipulates that if any of those fail, a whole new set of 10% has to be tested and passed in order to prove that correct commissioning. And then another 10% if any fail, another 10% if any of those fail and so on. This introduces quite a lot of unknowns into project plan planning and budgeting. It should be said actually that in my four and a half years of acceptance testing at Fairheat, if we'd have taken this 10% plus 10% approach, instead of the 100% approach from the outset, I don't think there would have been a scheme where we didn't actually end up testing 100% of dwellings. Results wise, this 100% dwelling testing ensures that commissioning issues are not missed. Say for example, these, these graphs on the right, this shows return temperatures from two phases of a London development. The top graph shows return temperatures from the first phase, which didn't go through any testing at all. And the bottom graph shows uh, the second phase where 100% of those dwellings were acceptance tested. And you can see there's a drastic difference between the return temperatures showing that performance is actually being met in this phase. In the second graph here, um, I think Tom uh, Burton actually touched upon this in his presentation earlier. A small, uh, small percentage of dwellings can actually have a drastic impact on this overall performance. So this graph shows um, cumulative uh, flow and volume uh, against the number of dwellings. This is a roughly 100 dwelling scheme, and it shows that 10% of the dwellings uh, contribute to 60% of the total flow on a system. So if we underwent uh, acceptance testing on the 10% plus 10%, it's actually very likely that a lot of these um, poorly performing dwellings would have been missed in this, um, this approach showing and then therefore would have resulted in high high flows and therefore high return temperatures and therefore poorer resident um, perception of the scheme. This really highlights that uh, remote BMS and heat meter data can also be additionally used to ensure that the heat network is actually operating correctly and performance targets are met outside of this acceptance testing period. So, uh, moving on to actually the process of the acceptance testing. This is actually something that we've developed at Fairheat over the last five years and six years as well. Actually, sorry, six birthday event. Um, acceptance testing, we've come up with this definition which shows that it's rigorous testing to verify your heat network performance, ensuring installation, commissioning and operation are as per the design and performance specification. Typically, this term has actually been focused on dwelling level tests However, now it's being introduced uh, as a coverall term applying to performance tests carried out in the energy center and at a building level as well. This process was developed to ensure that all performance issues with individual units and the system as a cohesive unit are addressed as it's significantly more expensive and disruptive to carry out rectification works post occupation. As highlighted previously, this is now included in CP1 2020. But it's also um, in planning to be a market, uh, sorry, heat networks are in planning to be a market regulated utility by um, Q1 of 2023 at the latest, but it could be by the end of 2022. Um, so therefore many developments currently in planning will fall under this. So it's definitely something that developers and contractors will need to be aware of to factor into their processes. More of that from Ricky and Paul later. So now we'll detail the two types of testing, uh, acceptance testing, starting with the energy center and building level. As I said, the building level, there's been a historic focus on commissioning your individual components separately with the assumption that the DevOps and control system will tie all of the operation together with occasional tests proving that the system can actually operate stably at its peak load. However, as uh, heat networks are dynamic systems, the plant equipment needs to be proven to operate under variable and part loads, seeing as these peak loads are rarely seen on systems and only last for a matter of minutes. We'll go through the whole process on the next slide. However, carrying out these load tests on the plant room ensures that design and KPIs are met under these varying loads and ensuring the system operates correctly and as a cohesive unit. 
So yeah, load testing is able to prove this operation for both phased and whole developments. Once all the plant room equipment is commissioned separately and a sufficient number of endpoints um, are connected to the network and commissioned correctly as well, um, the load test can be undertaken. We'd recommend that this is carried out with the sort of BMS engineers and also boiler or heat pump manufacturers on site to ensure that any adjustments can be made there and then based on the performance observed. Load is um, introduced gradually onto the system, building up to that design peak load. In particular, we focus on sort of key plant operation modes, i.e. Um, additional boilers or pumps coming on or offline, uh, changeover of heat generation equipment once the thermal store is depleted, for example. This particular focus on sequencing and changeovers ensures that heat delivery is not compromised in these periods of changing load, return temperatures actually remain low, and as per design, and your pump differential pressure is maintained across the network. Heat meter data becomes incredibly useful at this stage as flow and demand can be monitored at all points in the system um, alongside your temperature and pressure data obtained from your BMS. I should say that um, Sula touched on her presentation, um, the idea of seasonal commissioning. And yes, again, this is when your BMS and heat meter data can be included to fully prove the system performance over period of time. In practice, these are some of the uh, issues that we've observed on site. Um, as you can see, there's a whole, a whole range of issues from heat generation equipment to uh, pumps and the network commissioning and also the controls as a whole. Um, with an example actually on the right hand side here, uh, these are two iterative tests over two days. Um, and these are secondary flow temperature and return temperature on the secondary side of a sort of district heating plate heat exchanger. In the load test on the first one, once this load was induced, the return temperature was dropping as we would expect as a demand was induced on the system. However, the secondary flow temperature also dropped drastically as well during this period. And then also once this load was removed, the plate control caused several fluctuations in that return temperature as can be seen in the dips on the, in the blue line in the top right hand corner. Once these changes were, uh, once these um, issues were investigated and the changes were made, the fluctuation was completely eradicated on um, the, on a reiteration of the load test and the secondary flow temperature didn't drop nearly as much as the first time. This was then rectified further on the day to ensure that this uh, secondary flow temperature remained stable and the risk of heat delivery at elevated demand was drastically reduced. This dynamic and iterative testing ensured that these operational issues were again rectified pre-occupation. So I'll hand back over to Ellen, who will then go through acceptance testing from a dwelling side. So uh, from a dwelling perspective, acceptance testing is designed to focus on four key areas throughout the process. Heat network efficiency, regulatory compliance, resident comfort, and post occupancy cost. A set of commissioning parameters and installation benchmarks are set early in the process for commissioning engineers to work towards. Initial acceptance testing is first carried out, ideally, as soon as the first 10 to 20 dwellings are commissioned to prevent the escalation of systemic issues in commissioning. The end user equipment is then tested and checked to verify dwelling performance by inspecting for installation issues and faults, and then carrying out rigorous testing in all three modes of operation, standby, domestic hot water, and space heating. Next slide, please. So the process can be simplified to what is seen here. First, we look at installation issues and faults, such as insulation quality, so the, the final run to HIU accounts for up to 50% of the overall network. And despite this, it's the most common for it to be insulated poorly. So we'll look out for ins the insulation standard um, amongst other faults such as heat meter errors. And we'll look at standby performance, which involves checking heat meter data to see real time performance. Uh, hot water performance, which includes checking how long residents need to wait for hot water. Uh, space heating performance, such as checking the commissioning of the heating circuits, whether they're radiators on for heating, uh, and ensuring that the heat output required for the room can be achieved. 
The correct commissioning of each mode of operation is essential to network performance as each mode either takes up a large proportion of the total flow or time in any given year, as is shown with the percentages. Next slide. So in practice, uh, a collaborative structured process has been proven to achieve excellent performance. Major issues can be identified before handover, such as HIU bypasses, radiators plumbed backwards or upside down, um, electrical issues, and testing 100% of dwellings ensures that all of these issues are addressed. So on the right here are Guru pinpoint graphs showing dwelling and network performance with low return temperatures during each mode of operation and subsequently low return temperatures on the network. Guru Pinpoint has proven to be an incredibly useful tool in visualizing this dwelling and network performance throughout the acceptance testing period and uh, also in ongoing performance analysis. Thank you, Ellen. Um, we've actually seen over the years that this process has myriad benefits, not just for one particular party of the, each project, but for all major stakeholders, like developers, designers, contractors, and ultimately the end users, the residents. This shows acceptance testing's real value and justifies its inclusion in CP1 2020. I'll now pass over to Ricky and Paul, who'll hopefully back me up and confirm some of these benefits, um, and they'll touch on this further in the next section. So first up, uh, Ricky is Operations Director at Orchard Plumbing. Hi there, Freddie, thank you. Um, yeah, in our experience with acceptance testing as a whole, going back four or five years ago, before we came across um, Fairheat, there was very little done in the actual dwellings. A lot of the uh, concentration and witnessing was actually carried out within the energy centres itself with all the time associated in that area. Um, when we first came across Fairheat and the acceptance testing over at Job at Chelmsford, we had large reports come back with a number of areas failing. Um, at the time, we, we had to adapt quite quickly um, to changing the ways we commissioned, setting up the plots. And the difficulties we initially had were with the plumbers, with lack of understanding and wanting to understand. Um, but soon with Fair Heat and talking with them, looking at upskilling our workforce, having the right equipment, and obviously, um, working through the correct process from the onset, it worked a lot better. Um, after you obviously initially set up and go through this process, we can have the reliability of once we actually hand over the plots, that we have very little defects and we have the, um, we actually have the peace of mind knowing that we are going to have a system that is set up correctly and a peace of mind also that when we do get calls, we know that it is not due to the design or the actual process we have followed throughout the commissioning and witnessing. Um, from a contract point of view, what we have also done, we have built in our own developer um, managers that will help with the witnessing ourselves. So if we are struggling or our team are struggling, they have a direct point of contact on site. Um, and we have now followed this up on all of our projects for ease, just to keep in the same processes going throughout. I think that's about it, Freddie, from our point of view. Uh, thank you very much, Ricky. Um, I couldn't find my unmute button then. Uh, thank you. Um, now moving on to developer's perspective with Paul Craig, uh, m and &E Site Manager at Telford Homes. Hopefully he's still on. Gareth, can you see um, Paul on the attendees list? I know he had some internet issues earlier. I can see Paul, but I can't hear him.
all of you there. John, do you want to jump in? Oh, Paul, can you can you hear us? Are you you're muted? There we go. Can jump in if Paul's having trouble. Yeah, might need you to, John. Yeah, okay. Totally unprepared for this little section, but um, yeah, we. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's uh, Telford Homes. We uh, we have a uh, installed a process of uh, 100% flat testing, as Freddie has said. Uh, it has proved um, vital across all our developments, and um, if we were just having the, the, the CP1 recommended 10% plus 10%. A lot of the little details that we are picking up um, in the, the very detailed sort of snagging process would probably be missed and would slip through. Um, as you probably picked up on some of the other discussions throughout the day, we only need a small amount of bypass on an HIU uh, for the network to go down. And as all the commissioning within the flat, um, it's picking up loads of little details, which collectively, you know, individually may be quite small, but they do all have a knock-on effect to the wider network. Um, yes, it is a time-consuming exercise, and yes, it happens at a fairly critical time, uh, normally in the, uh, hopefully in the weeks before handover, not the day before. Um, if, it's, um, if it's managed correctly, and we build the time into our, into our programs, any, any errors and um, discrepancies we, we do find, and you know, we all live in the real world, there are glitches here and there. We're finding that they are all getting swept up in the um, comprehensive sign-off process uh, related to all the acceptance testing. So, yes, it's time-consuming. Yes, there is a cost associated with it. But our uh, our, our after-sales department are basically handed over a flat that is snag-free, fully operational, um, tied up with a red bow around it, and everyone is happy. Well, hopefully that was basically what Paul was going to say. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Excellent. Yes, that's um, both uh, developer and contractor perspectives. Um, so I'd like to invite if anyone's got any questions to, to whack them in the, the Q&A box. Yeah, so if I just, the first question that came through is, um, from a developer's perspective, do you find it difficult factoring in acceptance testing into the project timeline, especially as it would be occurring into the immediate run-up to handover? I think, John, that's coming back to the point you made. It, it is coming in at quite a difficult time. It, it is, yeah. <clears throat> but because um, we've, uh, we've been rolling out acceptance testing on a, on a number of projects recently, uh, we know it's there. We know it's coming. Um, it's not like we wait till we've got 300 flats all sitting there and then acceptance test them all at once. As soon as we've got flats ready, um, there's a rollout process. We do, as Freddie mentioned, we do a, a sample of 10, sort of 10, 10 or 12 flats as soon as they're ready. To, to debug those so if there are any errors they're picked up early and are aren't, aren't rolled out so it's in theory it's a it's a tick box exercise but it's a very important tick box exercise that, um, that, that catches any errors thanks for that um question the second question is 100 percent testing necessary surely that's a huge cost slash time commitment Actually, yes, Ricky, so, what, what's your view on that? It is a um, it is a huge cost, like initially, um, but like I said before, is once we know the units are handed over, we know there's no issues with them properties, and it does highlight issues during that process. So rather than coming back on a defect that could have been resolved at an early stage when we've got people on site, it does help it in the end. Um, generally, as long as you have the set um, parameters set up from the onset. And you go through like um, Freddie has highlighted and Ellen that uh, you pick up all the initials, uh, initial problems. You don't then generally get that moving forward. And after the first ten percent, it is a lot quicker. John, do you have any view on that? Um, yeah, only that. So if, if we don't do one hundred percent, it could be the the ninety ninth flat that's got a problem on it, which bypasses the uh, the HIU or something, and uh, we're back to back to square one on the heat network. 
and plus, as, as Ricky was saying, if, if we've got problems on the site with errors in the flats, it's 10 times harder to rectify those once we've got a disgruntled tenant sitting there than if we can iron it all out beforehand over. Yeah, definitely. So, Freddie, you, you're leaping in? Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, in addition to sort of the making sure that everything's picked up, in regards to sort of the time, time impact of it, this is where it comes comes back to process, process, process. I mean, if you kind of dive into this thinking it's going to be an easy procedure just to sort of go in, sign off a flat, then you need to sort of have a real think about it because we've got the exceptions testing sort of procedure to a stage where it is with all of these sort of gateways and uh, processes in place to ensure that everything is as clear as possible between all parties, say the developers, ourselves, uh, the contractors and also with assistance from the designers as well to ensure that everyone knows exactly what they're doing at all stages to um, make sure that the process actually just runs as smooth as possible and as ricky said the the first visit ensuring there's maximum sort of clarity clarity and collaboration between ourselves and the contractors uh, lots of site present ensures that any queries that they have and any sort of uh, systemic issues can be picked up as soon as possible and then not rolled out towards the rest of the site Thanks for that. Um, another question that's come through. How long does a 100% acceptance testing typically take? Are we talking two, three weeks or a month? Any, any thoughts on this? It, it's not that, not that long. Oh, hang on. Sorry, guys, can you hear me now? Or have I come oh, yeah, back? we can. Brilliant. Yeah, I'll come oh, back. Yeah, I don't know what was going on with that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, from experience, the acceptance testing doesn't take too long at all. We normally get around 20, 20 plots a day. Is that right, guys? Assuming we, we go through the correct procedures, we go through our QAs, we get everything in place beforehand and we achieve the, the desired standard as per the, the benchmark visits. Sorry about that previously. I don't quite know what was going on. The, uh... That's okay. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, sort of reiterate that. Um, depends really on just how one, how large the, large the scheme is um, and how, how quickly sort of commissioning can occur at a dwelling level. Um, Exception testing can really just follow follow that up straight away in order to verify that the commissioning and installation has been done correctly. Um, and as Paul says, you can with a with single person you can cover about twenty in a day. So it's really just based on how how quickly the the scheme can be built and, and commissioned. Really, yeah. For me, the the time is actually in checking it before um, the likes of Fair Heat would come out. That's where we lose, where, where we spend the time, obviously, making sure things are correct before that day. Yeah, definitely. As Ricky says, we go, when we go through the, our internal QA by, as we've adopted the acceptance test procedure as part of our standard procedures now, we spend a lot of time pre-acceptance testing, making sure they're ready, making sure the insulation's intact, making sure everything's as per design. So we can fast track this acceptance testing process and maintain 100% plots um, in line of our program and, and well ahead of handover. And I think that actually is the joy of acceptance testing because we're actually getting, I think we're now seeing the systems that are coming through and the performance we're coming through and the customer impact as a result of that process going through actually being, being much higher. Um, it's a question from Dominic Latham. Um, is a guru system or similar important for finding issues in the network slash HI use? John, you're nodding away. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, with the, um, although it's primarily a metering and billing system, uh, the, the pinpoint software that supports it is a great diagnostic tool so we can monitor the systems. Um, and, you know, if you've got an HIU that's going to fault for any reason, rather than try to hunt through 300 flats to work out which one it is, we can pick out straight away and go and knock on Mrs. Jones's door or the door next to her cor in the corridor hopefully in the uh, future projects and uh, resolve the fault. We had, Ellen. So we had a, an anecdotal one one of our projects a little while ago where there was a, a shower had been left running for about a month we thought it was our fault having left it running from a, uh, a load test um, completely wrecked the bathroom which all had to be refitted out but uh, the pinpoint demonstrated that actually the shower was turned on two weeks after we handed over the keys to the flat and it was actually the, uh, the owner operator who had left it running there conscientious she'd been having a cheeky shower and we told them that they would turn the shower on at four o'clock on a certain day and we had the computer evidence to prove it so uh, it's a very good diagnostic tool for many reasons 
yeah i think it, it it helps especially to find those like last few flats that are poorly performing you know that graph that freddie showed with um the the 10 percent of flats taking up the majority of flow um it can really help that further along if hiu starts bypassing or um is in any sort of fault mode we can catch that by just looking on guru pinpoint so it's a great for ongoing performance analysis yeah i think data is really important and i think that's been a theme coming through we need that i think it's really important as well to close the loop um thank you very much that's all the time we've we've got um thank you very much for coming on today uh just want to also highlight we've got a half hour break now um, before we are then at 3.15 going on to talk about how we decarbonize um, heat networks. So that's a two hour session. I'm quite excited about that. Um, thanks for all the attendees today on the second session. I think it's been a really good, um, great session. Um, so thanks for coming along and we'll see you all soon.